No music here, please. This is that pedal show. Copyright. You're now part of the Musicians Against Music <laughs> pressure group. Hello, everyone. Hi, hey, everyone. Hello. Uh, to viewer comments and questions with our very special guest, Jack Griffiths. Oh, thank you very much. Who has joined us all the way from... Did you say Kent or Essex? Kent. Kent. Yes, that's where I dwell. Yes. Hello, uh, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thank uh, you very much for having me as, as a little part of this. Because we're doing a pedal board build with Jack tomorrow. Uh, here's the Spaniel. Uh, say hello, Rosie. <laughs> yeah, I know. You haven't got the words, have you? You haven't got actual human words yet. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so welcome back to regular viewers and to new viewers. Uh, I'm just going to move the monitors uh, so that I can see what's going on. Very good. Uh, yeah, Jack is, uh, we're off for a meat feast after this, and uh, so Jack's driven up. We're going to do a... Uh, that is food related, isn't that is, it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, he's done, he's Sorry. done a live stream with Anderton's before coming here. Oh, I've been here for two minutes. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, that sounds great. The meat, yeah. meat feast. That would be great. Um, but, yeah, but then, we, then we get stuck in bright and early in the morning, and we get... Get the board build done. Well, it, it's it's going to be a little bit, well, a little bit. I'm going to say it. It's going to be a behemoth. Yeah, um, looking forward to it though. So, so we've been likewise. talking about this for a while, and yes, it's taken to get everything together that you wanted for this build, and it's been really interesting talking to you about all the research that you've done about getting the board right, exactly what you need, because this is this has to do everything for you, right? From sessions to live stuff, you need to be able to take this everywhere. Yeah, and well, nail it. I was going to, you know, talk about this tomorrow, of course, as well. But I will say now, if I may, this is entirely your fault because I came here to see you guys a few months ago, quite innocently. And uh, <laughs> that's and, how it begins. <laughs> yes, and Dan said, uh, "Well, we should do your board," and I was very very pleasantly surprised by that and I appreciated it and as I was driving away I was thinking I don't know how to politely tell him that I, I've got a pedal board already and uh, you know I don't know what I would do to it so um, thank you very much but then I thought no that's the opportunity to make the best pedal board ever oh, okay so <laughs> oh, that's very kind so yeah a chunk of change later but uh, it's gonna be great yeah no, it will be really, it'll be really fun so see what tomorrow has in store but for now What's what's the format for these things? This is it. Yeah. Just okay. Talk nonsense. I'm two hours. We, uh, we 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 start off doing a um, roll call, uh, and just see who's on. I need my phone just to see. So okay. That, so that I can be in contact with BV. Dave Johnson. Yes, this is Jack from Peach Guitars. The X, from the X guitar X Peach Guitars, I should say. True. But you would have seen Jack on Peach Guitars. Yes. Hello, and, Dave. Uh, astonishing guitar player. They're like him. Thank you. Um, he also, um, when I close my eyes, I think I have his hair. It's <laughs> uh, what it's like. Um, well, on your head? Or... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know. Hair is hair. Um, so. <laughs> okay, first off, thank you to BV for moderating uh, and being in the comments. Uh, thank you very much, BV. We uh, appreciate it. Uh, not time. least all the... Um, text telling me to turn the super chats off because we've got too many so we'll do that now um that's the best noise i've ever heard a phone make i'm not quite it's the minions where they say make oh make oh make oh but uh. it sounds like michael 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 okay uh and it makes me laugh every time yeah, i hear it yeah it's brilliant <laughs> Banana. um uh, a stewart says greetings from an overcast owen sound ontario canada <clears throat> i'd love to go to canada mm. um Blame Canada, blame Canada. <laughs> Mark Siever says, hi from Portland, Oregon. Have you done Portland and all the various musical establishments no. therein? No, I haven't been up there. I've been to Northern California, uh, but never to Oregon. Uh, no. Would love to. As far as I'm aware. Would love to. Mm. You say multiple. Uh, what, what's out there? Oh, I know you've got, Pro Guitar Shop was there, right? Well, there's loads of uh, amazing pedal builders in Oregon. Benson. Oh. Yep. Um, He's there, isn't he? Yep. You've also got... There's quite a lot. Uh, the, Put uh, them in the thing below. Yes. Okay. 
Um, so I'm trying to do I'm trying to do two two things at once here, Dan, and suffering significant cognitive stress. Uh, don't do that. Um, Such is life. Mm. It's a psychological term. Adam D says hello from Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Right. Okay. Joe yeah. Caliguri says hello from California. Richard Chester. Evening all from Hartford, Cheshire. Lovely. That's the first UK viewer there. Okay. Gary Mosley is on. He's also a UK viewer. Hi, Gary. Nice to hear from you, mate. Steve uh, Mass. Greetings from Lake Michigan. And we have the San Fernando Valley. Uh, Paul Hammingson. Tim Halligan from Perth in Australia. Oh, very good. It's I an international Perth. affair. It is. Awesome. It's an international uh, John Prudholm. <laughs> Cheers from rainy Seattle. Uh Tegan underscore K, greetings from rainy Norway. I'm assuming that's a Norwegian symbol. Um, David Pekarski yeah. is reminding us to put the podcast to record. Thank you very much. It's very helpful because <laughs> <laughs> I often forget. So many people run this operation then. Well. Both in this room. That's because the person who actually the, runs it is the camera. basically incapable. <laughs> <laughs> Not very nice, is it, Dan? Uh, it's okay. I'm used. I'm uh, there. I meant um, me. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, evening from Liverpool, says Chris Prescott. Um, Essex calling Danielle Williams, uh, Norfolk, Virginia, Zachary Allen, and Christopher Butler. Hi from Long Island, New York. New York. David Rustad says I'm looking younger. It's because I've had a haircut. Uh, nice. The missus cuts my hair. Which is she great. Does a great job. It's uh, it's good value. Mm. Yeah, it started in COVID, where one couldn't get a haircut, so we invested in clippers, and uh, watched loads of how to cut hair on YouTube. Right. And um, that's a good investment to make. There we are. I think the clippers, because it was COVID, the clippers were all triple the price they would have been. Let's talk about haircuts. Right. When was your last one, Dan? Yeah, it was a long, long time ago. Do you do your own these days? No, I'm, I'm tempted to. Yeah. I'm tempted to. Um, I'm thinking there's a bit of healthy hair at the back here. I'm just going to grow it out. Get it out. Start yeah. the Mr. Whippy thing going. I think that could so work for you. <laughs> you know what, though? That's one thing. This is another thing altogether. Oh, stop it. It and isn't. That, it's completely is different. No. Glory no, be. No, don't. Because I can't do this no. at all. Oh, poor Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't give you many man points. You could. You just let it go like I did in COVID and ended up with a 14-year-old's beard. It kind of works eventually. A well, if that's a 14-year-old, then a I'm... A ginger 14-year-old. I'm on a 14-month... make it even worse. You're but, uh, an old level. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I just can't do it. Um, and I am envious of those who can, which is apparently everyone else in the world. Mm, uh, yeah. Maybe it just happens one day. You have a second round of puberty, perhaps, and ben, beards happen. Ben Jammer says, hell yeah, rat tail for Dan. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Ah, oh, boy. Okay, so for any of you who don't know, this is Jack. Uh, he's joining us for Pedalboard Build uh, tomorrow. Um, we're going to just we're testing out a new format on you, Jack. This yeah, is the we truth are. Truth of the matter. Oh. We thought we thought we'd do like Pedalboard SOS, and because <laughs> we get loads of comments from viewers, it's like, please help. Yeah. So I thought, yeah, let's let's give it a go. Um, awesome. And. Uh, Let's start with, let's just get a, an awesome guitar player to get these going. Um, well, thank, it's a yeah. pleasure to be a part of. No, yeah, great. we'll Very kick good. it off. Uh, BV says, uh, Mick, does Rosie run when she hears the clippers? No, we, we <laughs> worked really hard on Rosie uh, with the clipping. So now she looks forward to the clipping lady coming and she jumps up on the table, sits there and she just waits for it. Bless wow. her. And I have to Not get... Not your experience. No, no. Ziggy is... Uh, He's. We have to take him to get sedated, for him to be clipped. Uh, uh, right. He, yeah, it's such. He had, we took him to this place, a reputable place apparently, and he just had the most awful experience. Uh -huh. And I we ended up taking him to a dog psychologist, if you can believe it, because we didn't know anything about you know. But they they are really affected by and re remember this stuff mm. for like a long time, um, and. Getting, getting Ziggy out of that mindset is a man. It's an extraordinary amount of work. Yeah. How old is Ziggy? So Ziggy's four now. Yeah. Oh right. But he's one of those dogs. He'll always be a puppy, you know. And play, always, you know, 
Uh, Kevin and David Rustad, I've just got the Mick looking younger comments. You're talking about Jack. Sorry, I've been so slow. I've been so slow. I don't look younger at all. It's because Jack's here, right? Yeah. Well, there could there is a similarity here. To be fair, Jack. Apart from yeah, the beard, once again. How old are you? Twenty something. Twenty seven. I could legitimately be your father and not in a sort of awful teen way. I've never found my father. Yeah, have you not? No, I have. But, uh, <laughs> you, you could be. Yeah. Very good. For the next few hours. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you're slightly nicer here, Jack. That's very yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> How is Jane, anyway? Oh, uh, Jane. <laughs> Sorry, I was just... No, I've slipped off now. I was, I was completely out in the blue there, hoping your mum's name might be Jane. <laughs> no, but you know what? <laughs> You're not far off, and I can give you three guesses as to what my mum's name is. Julie. No. Joan. Think. Jill. Yeah. Ah, there you go, of course. Think, don't think. Yeah, yeah Jack yeah, and yeah. Jill. Thanks for that, mum. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> nice bit of system one. Okay, um, before further ado then, let us get into the super chai for this evening. And thanks to everyone who super chatted. I'll turn them off. Um, so if you super chatted up to when I turned them off, Chris Turner was the last one. Um, we will answer. If you haven't, there's always next week. Plexico. Duncan, really nice to hear from you, buddy. Hi, buddy. He says, greetings, d &M. Oh, God. Lots of noise on the Fender Tone Master Pro. Any experience yet? They. Hang on. I'm some curious to ask you that as well. Through actually. some sort of miscommunication, they sent us one, which is really odd because I thought most people know that it's not really our thing. Mm. Um, I'm kind of interested in the powered cab. Yes. If it's analog. If there's no latency, because that could work quite well as a, a wet, um, you know, you could yeah. run it as a wet satellite, as it were. Yeah, and, and they actually look good. Yeah. I, I saw one in person only the other day, and um, there's, what's nice about that as well is it seems to have like a full suite of EQ. Yeah. So it's laid out like a guitar amp, like you expect to be able to operate a guitar amp. I've not tried one, so I don't know how it sounds. I don't know what speakers in it i presume just some kind of yeah i just FR, i feel quite, FR thing. quite positive about it well, this is the first time it's been out of the box yeah um so there we go for anyone that was disappointed not to see the tone master pro on that pedal show there it is there it is there we go good Fun. that'll be going back tomorrow that's it um there's something to be said for the form factor of it because i think now we're kind of that's a nice little sweet spot helix for some people is a little too big right quad cortex i don't know if you guys have ever tried any of that stuff, a little bit too, too small for, for some things. We, we have back there somewhere. Ah, oh, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not our thing, Duncan. Um, I, we are, we remain <laughs> one of the last places on the internet where you can hear mic amps, and we stay that way. We just I, maybe we'll get into this tomorrow, but yeah, I get increasingly frustrated with it all. Yeah. We will get into it tomorrow. Have you got one then? I can say that. Well, I, I won't say at this point because I don't want any hostility to to, to come about. But, no, um, no. no. There'll not... be a conversation. We'll no, kill no, you by definitely... the end of the day. <laughs> they, they have their point. I, th I, I guess we're in a, in a unique position where we can yeah, ridiculous go out position. And, and use real amps. As and so, you absolutely should. And, and yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and the, you know, the more we were asked a question this week about if we absolutely had to, and I was like, "Oh, that's really interesting." Oh, it was a good segue. Yeah, it was uh, Andy Wood. Andy Wood was in this week, and we did we filmed with Andy, and far out, man! Andy. What an astonishing guitar player. Um, and human being. Yeah, it's just really, really great. And we had him <coughs> plugged in. He was going into the TS1, two rock TS1, uh, as the kind of front end dry amp oh no it was stereo wasn't it yeah stereo between the the, the two two rocks yeah two two rocks and a, hmm. and a some ev speakers which he really likes and um it was just biblical <laughs> anyway the question was for his patrons if you absolutely had to choose dan said i'll give the gig to someone else and i said can i have a blue gamp one and he said no no you can't. no to both yeah so i went with an original pod only because okay. i know how to drive it yeah, but yeah. to be honest I reckon 
I could take my old hotcake and plug that straight into a desk and get as good a sound as. Oh, we've all had gigs in those situations, and haven't we? And they're great. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're fizzy and, and desk, but you're there on and... Fizzy and desk. They're fizzy and desk. I'd be like, are you sure that's a Marinair Transformer, mate, in, that, <laughs> in the front end of that desk? Neve 88 RS or nothing else, all right? <laughs> Sometimes you just need to plug into whatever will give you sound. Yes, um, absolutely. I, I think we're all agreed on that. Yeah. But given the choice, anyway, let's not go there again. Anyway, Andy <laughs> came in, um, and Andy Wood, and he signed this OnePlug gearbox, which will be this month's patron giveaway. Nice. Very nice. Have you played that? We did. We played it with Andy when he was here. And right. It's just really great. Yeah. Really great. Yeah, it's one of those. I mean, when we when Dan and I tra tried it, I think we found it a little complex, maybe, and. Uh, maybe misunderstood the mid control a bit, but yeah, and with Andy a, playing it, yeah, who and he, knows it inside out, clearly it sounded flipping mm. unbelievable. Yeah, I think isn't it loosely like a, a pinnacle on one side and a um, clon, clon like the tumnus, T yep. yeah, tumnus, yeah, right. on the other, yeah. But he certainly made it sound pretty yeah. special. Mm. Yeah. So yes, um, look out for the email in your inbox. That will be the next patron giveaway signed by uh, Andy. It does have a box, I promise. Um, and it's orange, which is always good on that pedal show. Mm. Um, the winner of September's giveaway, who won a set of Minuendo lossless earplugs, the, the hearing show was going to be tomorrow, but I just have run out of time, so it will be somewhere else in the week. Um, and David from Albuquerque has won oh, those, lovely. so congratulations, congratulations to David. David. May your um, hearing be better for it. Uh, and the TPS store, final bit of housekeeping, two new items this week. We've called this the Because Tone Versity Cap. Uh, it's arrived cool. today and it's a brand new design. It's actually woven. It looks printed, but it's actually woven. Very fine weave. Oh, wow. Very small needles. Uh, and uh, I much love. Runs the candlelight going blind <laughs> years after <laughs> sight. Uh, I think it's a machine. Uh, our Electron Tube tea is finally back in stock, this time on a black tea with an orange logo. Uh, thank you to everyone who buys merch. It's how we keep going. Tell me we've called it None More Black. Uh, no, because then the logo would have to be black as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. There we go. Smell the glove is in. <laughs> no, it's here. It's here, boys. Sorry I, didn't, the glove. sorry I didn't gear up, by the way. I think this some, works. Some yeah, branding. But a little shout out to, to yeah. Mike there. but We're always yeah. happy yeah. to see, uh, always have to see, see analog anything analog. analog man. Yeah. Um, no question, just showing my appreciation for everything, says Matt McGrath. Thank you, oh, Matt. thank you, buddy. Uh, much love to the TPS family and community. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Right back it. at you, Matt. Thanks so much. Uh, RM Timeshift says, hello, no question. I just wanted to say I totally enjoyed the Simon McBride episode. Thanks for the great content. Oh, you're very welcome, mate. That's very kind of you. Sorry, yeah. a bit of a... That was, a, that was an astonishing day, actually. Mm. Mm. Um, we have had Simon in before. And it was really great. But then now he walks in as the guitar player in Deep Purple. And it was like, he's still in shock. And he's like, this is my life now. <laughs> it's just wonderful. I, yeah, I can imagine that is a monumental shift. Yeah. Um, I And I, I, I've seen Simon play before. I've never met him. Um, but watching that, I really didn't want to like him. Because I'm a Richie Blackmore died in the wall fanatic right but he's just brilliant he is absolutely and brilliant. i love the way that he he talked quite a bit in that about dissecting the tunes yeah and figuring out the parts but then also just deciding that well, it's a rock and roll band yeah i have yeah. to bring my own yeah character to this um just he hit the nail dead on the head yeah. and uh it was really nice to see and he sounds obviously sounded fantastic as well yeah it was a bit of guilty pleasure wasn't it amp gain loop Delays and reverbs, very kind of enveloping, mm. produced kind of guitar sound, really wonderful. Yeah, effect. and it's it's lovely seeing the way that he has brought some of those sounds in to Deep Purple because he only ever uses them as like a spot fill every now and then just yeah. to change yeah. the feel of things a mm. little bit. Like at the end of the solo uh, where he'll put on uh, uh, the slicer and yeah. get this feedback going and just, you know, just to take the solo, which was already going to a ridiculous place, just to push it way over the edge. And the the band have been 
mm. so up for us, you know. And yet he does that but while remaining completely respectful yeah. and acknowledging the band he's, he's with, you know, and, and indeed the band he's in now. And that's a hard thing to do. It's a, yeah, yeah. So really full, great. full credit to the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah wonderful. Yeah. Lots of love for the Johnny Marr Jag from Ryan McCutcheon tonight. Uh, yeah, John Cordy says, tell Jack to keep hold of his peppermint tea. That's right. Yeah, got to meet John uh, last week and uh, had a couple of coffees and I did uh, drop, well, nearly drop a cup of peppermint tea. Nice. And that's how I'll be known from now on. See, he doesn't suck either, does he, as a player? He gets, you know, he gets around. <laughs> you can, nice to have you, John. Hope you're doing well, mate. Yeah, in fact, I'm going to see awesome. you on Wednesday night. Uh, Scott McKeon is playing with his band. A few key uh, additions might even be Jeremy Stacey on drums um, up at Lottie's. So oh, wow. We'll go up there. Be seeing you Wednesday, John. Very cool. Uh, good. E Carl Longbottom. Hi, Carl. Good day, mate. Always good to hear from you, buddy. He says, Evening, gents. Hope you're well. The London International Guitar Show is on the 29th of October. If anyone is coming, please come by and say hello. Okay, 29th of October, London International Guitar Show. Uh, please hit that up on the internet and uh, go along and say hello to Carl and everyone else. Do we know where it is? Uh, Let's see. They're usually at Olympia, aren't they, those things? Right. Sorry, I've got a bit of rice or something which I have now retrieved. And consumed. Mm. <laughs> oh, I threw it on the floor, actually. Ah. The that dog, Rose will, will get that the later. dog will sort that out. <laughs> yeah, I had mackerel and rice for lunch. <laughs> She'll definitely get that. For anyone later. who's interested, King Oscar mackerel fillets are on offer in Waitrose at the moment. Ah, Kemp and they're the best. Kempton Park Racecourse. Oh, okay. Mm. Mm, that's not in London, is it? The London International Guitar Show. No. Kempton Park Racecourse, uh, Staines Road, Sunbury on Thames. Oh, well, okay. So a bit like um, how Stansted is. A London airport, is it? Yeah, there? Luton. <laughs> yeah, London Luton Airport. I, I, I did see that show come up, and I may try and head. I've never been to a guitar show ever, um, and that one is relatively yeah, accessible. So, in terms of getting to it, so. very briefly, back in the mid late eighties, guitar shows were completely brilliant because you'd be you'd be at Olympia or somewhere walking down the an aisle, and Albert Lee would walk past you, and Luke Ather and mm. And they used to get Madonna. up and jam, and it was really cool. And then, sort of in the 90s and into the early 2000s, they got a bit crap because they got really corporate. And they became very expensive to attend, yeah. and oh. Future Publishing messed it all up, which was a company I used to work for. Uh, and then, just recently, these little regional guitar shows that have started popping up, and the kind of ones that you were talking about, Carl. And, you know, you'll see all kinds of people there, loads of good mates. Nothing overly flash in terms of stands, so mm. it's it's cost effective for the for the exhibitors. Mm. They have quite a good family feel from from the ones I've been to more recently, and it feels kind of vibey again, as opposed to Marshall t t having to turn up with fifty eight four twelves and everyone stood on the stand like that. Yeah, yeah. Hard, must be a hard thing to get right nowadays, though. Um, you compare it to something like the scale of Nam. Of course, I mean that's yeah. just, that's the they've got the American way written all over it. Crazy. But yeah, I should have clarified that I've never been to a UK guitar show. Right. So um, yeah, you only do the international stuff, right? I uh, if there's not a plane involved, <laughs> I'm staying. Oh, they're, well, they're nothing like Nam. Let's put it that way. <laughs> George Kelly says the late great Bernie Marsden's Beast will be at the guitar show. Oh, cool. Um, I feel it won't make many more appearances. No, I've been lucky enough to play that guitar many times. Hmm. What happens to a guitar like that now, I wonder? Because it, it, it itself is an entity, isn't it? And yeah, I mean, it is being sold, isn't it? I think they paused the sale when Bernie died. Is that right? right? Um, but it is being sold. Okay. I think it's already been sold, but anyway. Um, Noise Bloom says, Immense respect for Jack's playing. Uh, really enjoyed his work with Peach Guitars. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, this is good. Parcel Force saying um, your £280 memory card will be here tomorrow. Oh, lovely. Thanks, Sony, for CF Express Type A cards. Uh, anyway. Um, Scott Pickett. Hello, Scott. 
He says, greetings from North Carolina. My new favourite song is Hurricane featuring Mick Taylor. Oh, God. Uh, your smile says it all uh, about why we play guitar. Thanks, mate. I, apparently someone took some video at a gig that I played with Ainsley and it's on the internet somewhere. So Awesome. Yeah, that's kind of you to say. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real blast and a pleasure to play with Ains. He's super generous hmm. to, uh, you know, allow that much time and... Um, it's all good. He's in Germany at the moment. If anyone's watching from Germany, please go and see Ainsley's band. They're really killer. Good energy, amazing playing, proper loud guitar sounds, happy days. Um, so please do that. Mm. This is interesting. Um, Simon V Radio DJ says the UK needs to have a NAM style show. I, I don't know if it does. I think there are some really great regional shows. There's a, there's a show that Mick and I go to a lot, which is in Birmingham. And I think it's the same uh, group of people that put them on. There's, there's a bunch, well, there's, it's the Judean People's Front and the People's Front of Judea, <laughs> isn't it? it? There's, right. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Split I think, up! Yeah, yeah. Um, is that at the, the NEC? Is that where the show is? There used to be one at the NEC. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't Yeah, know. oh no, this one's in a, like a. Yeah, the Bingley Hall, New the Bingley, Bingley Hall. Hall. Yeah. Um, which I think, but I think there's a lot of down. No, I, oh, I don't know. I should, okay. I should shut up. Um, the Dallas Guitar Show is awesome, says Brad Guitar Man in Texas. Yes, it oh, flipping man. is. I've never been. It would be nice to go. That's the one, isn't it? That's the one to go to. Dallas Guitar Show. Mm. That's where all the serious people go. Okay. Yeah. Oh right. But just, I mean, I know everyone loves a a bad story and. To, talk crap about potentially bad events but it will be interesting to see what happens to NAM over coming years because it is so phenomenally expensive to exhibit yeah yeah and if you think about what NAM was for in the early days it was people unveiled new product manufacturers dealers came along and put their orders in and that's what NAM was for and that it's still how it functions but of course now the product release cycle isn't tied to just once a year and the internet exists mm -hmm. so its function as as that is no longer required but of course it is nice for everyone to come together and and uh, see each other and i think that's w what keeps it going isn't yeah, it yeah the social aspect of it is you must have some insight valuable. to that well I, I only i went a couple of times was very lucky to do so but i, I went in the capacity of a dealer essentially so yeah. it was marketing based so in terms of being able to, which I presume a lot of people do, wander around as you wish and chat to who you wish to, um, it was slightly more mission focused when I went. So I would be curious to go back again in that capacity, just as a f kind of a free agent to go and check it out with, with both eyes fully open. But it, um, as I imagine you guys found, just the walking alone is <laughs> yeah. absolutely exhausting. So then to, and the noise. Yeah, it's yeah, the crazy. Noise is astonishing. It is crazy. Properly, properly crazy. I mean, it's amazing. And as I said, I'm very, very grateful to have been able to go. But um, it, twice in my case was enough. I don't know how many, how many times have you guys been out there? No, over 20. Yeah, lots and lots. Uh, 1996 or 97 was my first year. Right. You were born then. I was. Yeah. I was. I could not attend. When were you born? 96. <laughs> <laughs> Scott McDonald. Hi, guys. Uh, question for Dan. Have you ever changed the valves in your base breaker 15? Any suggestions? I have killed the power section in mine. Uh, yes. I did change them and just put some JJs in and they're great. Was it E L eighty fours? Yeah. Yeah. If the power section is gone, there's not much you can do about that. Do check the fuse. Uh I know you've probably already done that, but there will be an HT fuse in there somewhere, probably. Um should be on the back panel. And they those sorts of things go for a pastime. So it might be that. Mm. But if there's a light on on the front, it's not that. Uh yeah, sorry to hear that. <clears throat> Sean Jeremilatos. Jeremilatos. Sean Jeremilatos. Every week and every week I struggle. Uh, how is that possible? Sorry, Sean. 
He says, hi, DNM. I tried TPS wet dry with Kingsley Maiden and Page into a Mesa 2020 and 112 cab wet and a Marshall 74 clone kit I built. Wow, ridiculous fun. The Marshall clone has some serious grunt for 18 watts. Once you go wet dry, it's really hard to not. Yeah, and presumably a point to point 74. Yeah, that's 18 watts you won't forget in a hurry, isn't it? Indeed. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be I, great. One day someone will explain that to me in a way I understand it. Like, why is a matchless lightning louder than any 100 watt solid state amp I've ever heard? Yeah, it's the it's the way that you rate them. I think um, Gordon Rankin, Maybe who is on, any good day, mate. Watt solid state <clears throat> amp. We, we, we talked about this a while ago. It all comes down to the way they, they rate them. But And the thing about the valve, when it's limiting, it's pushed beyond its what it's rated to do, it just sounds glorious. Mm. But the solid state amps... That's their limit. That, that, when they get to that limit and they start to break up, it sounds like something is wrong. Yeah, mm. yeah. So they, you know, it has to be RMS um, as opposed to peak music power output. I think RMS is... Uh, uh, root mean squared. Root, that, that'll do. And so when you see when you go onto Jeff's online jumble sale and you find a little speaker for your kitchen and it says output three thousand watts, watts PMPO. <laughs> 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 um, Fender nineteen sixty CS says, uh, "Hey TPS, hope you're all having a blessed day." I saw Andy Timmons. Uh, show online this past Saturday. He was repping TPS with his black electron tube t-shirt. He was uh. like this, but different colors. Um, by the way, I always feel educated and inspired after watching. Thank um, you, mate. Uh, you might mean us. Hopefully you mean Andy, because we're the same. Yeah. Always feel educated and inspired after watching him play the guitar. If anyone here has not seen uh, Andy's they call stage at live concerts that he does, um, you need to go to Andy's page and subscribe, and he'll let you know when they're, they're happening. They are remarkable. So Andy started doing this over lockdown as a way to keep going, mm. you know, because obviously everything stopped. And I used to watch him religiously during lockdown, and far out, man. There's something about watching him do that stuff live, because he's using all... You know, it's got the amps and everything mic'd up and everything's just, you know, he sounds astonishing. Hmm. And he plays all that stuff so effortlessly. And then he talks about it and then he, he'll sing a couple of songs and it's it's the most oh, wonderful right. way to spend an afternoon. It really is. Just magic. from home. Just from home and just watching awesome. him do his thing. And, you know, he, he really, uh, whenever Andy plays, it's emotional. And he has somehow managed to get that experience across on a on a YouTube mm. uh, or should say stage at thing, and it's amazing. So if you haven't seen Andy Timmons live on his stage at things on a on the weekend, make a point to do it because it is remarkable. Right, I haven't in fact, so I yeah, it's, re it's I will absolutely do so. worth it. Uh, Gary Mosley says, uh, enjoyed the Ainsley gig, Mick. Um, what did you have on your board? Okay, uh, a few people have asked this. So starts with a Dan Drive Austin blender, which is his octave fuzz, which is the, the Doyle Bramwell octave fuzz, basically. I use it for a couple of the songs with the blender off, so it's just doing a boost, and then for one of the songs with just the tiniest bit of octa. That then hits a um, Nordvan Gravity with the TS-10 first and the Klon after. And then that would then go into a delay, which is either a UA Del Verb or uh, a Keeley Timmons Halo. And then that would then go into a Neo Instruments micro vent, the Leslie one, not the Fender one. Uh, yeah. And right. for the solos, everything's on apart from the Leslie. The Leslie did come on for the rhythm parts though. For the rhythm parts, And it's yeah. like, Oh, he's got an organ player now. Oh, no, hang on. That's Mick. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, I even tried to learn a few keyboard um, voicings. Right. You know, close voicings, which makes a difference. Would either of you subscribe to the idea that once mastered, the Leslie pedal is probably the most valuable modulation pedal you can use? 
because it's so musical rhythmically, as you were saying about playing rhythm guitar. And then if you put it on a lead sound, it's uber dimensional. I think you could make a strong case think, for that. I think you could make a strong case yeah. for it. I think it, I think it very much depends on the player. Uh, like, I do love that sound, but it would never knock the mistress off my board. No. But, th but funnily enough, when you hear uh, like David Gilmore, and a lot of those Leslie sounds are the flanges. Uh, yeah, right. They, but there, there's there is a relationship, isn't there? there? Absolutely and is. And same with phases, right? So, I I sit in the um, triangle of harmonic tremolo, rotary speaker, and vibe, mm -hmm. and I I love them all equally. Mm. And sometimes you can kind of fake it at one to do the other's yes, job. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but. For this gig specifically, because there's a keyboard part with a strong Leslie on it, I thought I'll do the Leslie. But then one of the comments was, "Is that a chorus?" And it's like, "Well, kind of, yeah." Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that, especially being able to vary the speed. Well, that's the thing that, and similarly with a flanger, but they're so alive sounding. It yeah. takes a lot to figure out how you're going to use it, but particularly with the speed variation mm. yeah, yeah it's it's one of those things where you can say it's like an instrument within itself yeah totally um as long as you don't overdo it of course yeah well well it's not really us though but they're there to be how, overdone aren't how they? would that <laughs> okay uh, renan silver says question for jack do you still use your dr z remedy if yes in which context i got one years ago inspired by one of your videos and i still love that amp to death ah very nice um i do it's a great amp actually um for those who, is, the remedy is Z's take on a plexi, but it's 40 watts and it's got six V6s in it. Oh, I would like that. So it, to me, as with any amplifier, it's a pedal platform mm. and it does that very, very well. And the nice thing about that amp is it's got this kind of rude character. So I, I usually, like you, Dan, go for like an EL84 right. type thing and then put pedals on top of it. If I need something a little bit ruder, as in if I'm the only guitar player in a band and you just want a bit of extra aggression or something, the Remedy is great for that. Um, it's also got that clever thing where they jump at the channels okay. internally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of the, the crop of plexi type amps, that's definitely one of the best because it's mm. super simple, but it's got the features that you actually want on okay, that type I, of amp. I, I love the idea of 6v6s and yeah, 40 yeah. watts. That's really... Yeah, and his yeah. stuff, oh, man, it always sounds so good. I was, I, years and years ago, I think probably four shops ago, I was at Peach, oh, right. and uh, and John had, you know, I was trying out some Dr. Z amplifiers, mm. and they had a lot of the EL84s ones, and I was plugging into them, and I plugged into one, I thought, oh, this thing sounds amazing. It was a 6L6. Um, Fender style one, which was which was great, but all of their amps sounded so good. Mm. Yeah. Um, but see, I'm having an amp crisis at the moment because I last week we did a delay show. Right. And we did a proper wet dry wet delay thing. Okay. With the TS1 mm. as a center amplifier, and now I can't oh sleep. Yeah. <laughs> it's ruined me. It's the most astonishing sounding thing. The overdrive channel in that is. It was ridiculous. But then you go to the clean channel, it's like one of the best clean sounds I've ever heard. It's so, so rare that you hear an app that can do both. Mm. It's, yeah, amazing. I had a crisis over TS1 as well. Yeah, it's a, a crisis. Ago, and that's what they need to call the TS1 crisis. <laughs> and John, to his credit at the time, rightly said, when are you going to use that? Because it's, in fact, I haven't tried the um, revised version, which I think is what you have. Um, the the first generation of it sounded amazing, but unless you just use it as that pedal platform thing that I was describing, it it is kind of very difficult to make useful in the majority of situations. Maybe if you're, I suppose, doing the Robin Ford type thing and you're playing a lot of lead guitar, it's got the most magical mid range to it. Yeah. When, when do you choose that over your? The, well, uh, classic reverb. With the clean channel, I can just run pedals in the front and it sounds fab uh, as just a clean, you know, breaks up a little bit in the clean channel. And I love that. I, it, it reacts. It reminds me of some of the best Mark series boogies I used to love years ago. That's what I yeah, grew up on. Yeah, right. So there's a, there's a lineage there. 
in, in the clean. There's just so much headroom, but it's the harmonic complexity is all there, yeah. so the pedals work well. And then if I do use the, the drive channel, I would have all the pedals off hmm. and just use the drive channel for that one thing that it does. But it does it so unbelievably yeah, yeah, yeah. well. Mm. So via ordinary pedals, clean channel can get any any sound I need and then use its lead channel if you just want that that dumble mid sure. mid rich thing. But to be to be honest, uh if I'm gonna take one, I usually take the CRS. Yeah. 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 I mean I did I've done maybe two or three gigs this year with that. And um yeah, I love, I love it. Mm. I love it. It works for me. Shed asks, have you guys tried a magnetone recently? Every magnetone amp that I've heard, like the new ones, they sound amazing. So, I mean, I, we haven't had one in here. Mm. I'm assuming you've you had them. Yes. Yeah, I played a few and um, they are, they have that kind of classic Americanism to them. But it's all about the tremolo with those amps and oh, the okay. reverb. So they've got that, um, I suppose it is harmonic tremolo, but I think they call it something different Yeah. where it sounds like it's doing something to the pitch. Um, it's a stereo vibrato, isn't it? But because it's stereo, right. you, get you get the, the you really get, you get the phase yeah. relationship happening. Yeah. That was a that was <laughs> visual resident. That was impressive. Visual representation of stereo. stereo. We have lots of visual representations <laughs> of, of concepts. So this is stereo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, we have our phase representation, so Mick and I will be in phase, and now Mick will go out of phase. Oh, I can't do that. Okay. You're going too fast. There we go. There you go. Ooh. That made me feel a bit uneasy. I felt like I had to split my eyes yeah. somehow. But it, uh, yeah, good representation though. Um, happy Go Lucky. Greetings, gents. Would love your thoughts or a show on setting complementary guitar tones for two players in the same band to sound great together. We have done that, We actually. have done that. And our conclusions, in short, were... It doesn't really matter as long as the parts are complementary. So one of the problems is if you're both hammering away on the same chords, it can be overwhelming. So then it could be really useful to have quite different frequency bands but unless you're specifically playing a unison part which isn't that common um, you ought to be playing separate parts anyway that fit the song and therefore to speak with your own voice musically speaking is the right way to do it because that's yeah. the way you're most connected um, I would say trying to be prescriptive about you know one should have 6L6s and one should have EL34s or one should play a Les Paul and one should play a Tele is Maybe it's a start point, but it's problematic. What, what do you think about that? Uh, me? Or, yeah. Oh, I don't oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what do I think about it? Well, I would agree, and it's, it's particularly em emphasised when the two players play with less gain mm. and more volume, because, especially if it's volume-related, everything in your right hand or your picking hand is massively emphasized and actually interestingly enough, I've I've had past few days had a massive ACDC resurgence and thanks to the wonders of YouTube there's all the isolated tracks or some isolated tracks of of um, live albums and stuff and people talk about the the ACDC sound and if you listen to Malcolm's tracks and Angus's tracks they couldn't have more differing martial tones Wow Malcolm's so clean mm. and so precise and so you really hear the super bass, you hear the the thump from the strings and like the choke. And then you hear Angus's sound and it's usually more distorted than you might think, um, way brighter. And so those those are two guitar players in the same band that you would think have the same sound. And actually when you isolate them, they're radically different just because of the way they play as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the parts the are so complementary as well, aren't they? Yes. The yeah. things that yeah. they actually play are just just so locked in. And and the perception at times is that it's one guitar. Yeah. At times. At That's times. right. You don't hear it unless you strip those things away, which yeah. I suppose is why people do have that question about how to make it work. But Yeah. Um, I, I think, think... The, the, the worst I hear it is um, in heavier bands where 
you know, to be cliched about it or at least to to be reductionist about it, you know, both playing big pickups, both playing really super heavy gainy 5150 rectifier type sounds and both playing the same thing and then it yeah, it's just a, it's just a mess at that point. Yeah. We had a really interesting conversation with um, John Stockman from Carnival about that. And they, because they're really heavy, mm. but they have some amazing tricks to make the guitars work together. Mm. Right. And sometimes they'll just grab a boss EQ and every second fader all the way down and the other guy does the opposite. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they stick it on. It's like, and it's amazing how the sounds just go. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, you know, and obviously different parts and that sort of stuff. But it is a, it is the good fight. Mm. if you're mm. doing two guitar things to make it work together mm. so I guess the next question then comes well who <laughs> if you're both going for a similar sort of tone let's say you're both playing Les Pauls and Marshalls for want of a better example uh, who does the compromising <laughs> how do you the one mm. with the, the one with the better hair does the one that's up, that doesn't <laughs> compromise and the if one? you really can't come to an agreement on that I would say just make sure your parts are miles apart so one of you what was it Noel said it, it, he decided with Gigsy that he would, no, um, sorry, with Bonehead, that Bonehead would only, only play, play bar, bar chords, chords and Noel would only play open chords. Yeah. And then they just stayed out of each other's way. And then the sound of Oasis was born. <laughs> and just, come on. Amazing. But wasn't that, I don't know if it was in your video or somewhere else I heard him say, he only decided that because he didn't feel it looked looked cool enough to yeah, play it was bar chords. Yeah, I yeah. only want to play open shapes because I, I have to move contort my body in a way <laughs> that <laughs> that's not for me. You can do that. <laughs> so yeah, um, partly tonal, partly on what you play. If you it's such a you you may already be doing this, um, but if you haven't done it, spend some individual time, not at a band rehearsal, but you know get together with the other guitar player separately and really lock your parts in. It's such a great thing to do. Yeah. To really be, um, you know, clinical about it and break those parts down, so you really, really know what you're playing. I, until later in life, I hadn't realised for years and years and years. I've been sort of not quite getting it right in a lot of songs for a long time, just kind of hashing around the edges. But when you put the work in, same with vocal harmonies, when yeah. you put the work in, mm. it's it makes everything so much more fun because you're really nailing it on. And that can be for you know, I, I guess all of us have done those gigs where maybe the set list isn't entirely to your liking there is a great deal of pleasure in just playing the parts properly and and locking in as a band and really doing the song justice even if you don't really like it mm. hmm. yeah you kind of grow as a musician that way i think as well because you end up playing to the band mm. and you kind of you show yeah i, I can st i can stay within this lane but just wait till the chorus i'm going to do something a little bit different yeah and it encourages you to You've got the framework there, but you can reach out just a little bit and sure. in a musical way because you're appealing to other musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other, but the other way, can, like Brian Adams, a lot of the time, will, if he comes up with a great guitar part, he'll just simply get um, what's his face to double it, and then they'll they come to a different, different session and then they'll diverge oh, and right. then come back because mm. um, you know if you've got two guitar players who really lock in, playing the same thing can be really powerful. Mm. Um, with complementary tones, um, but I mean there are some you know bands that have done an amazing job of that over the years. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Mm -hmm. uh, there's go and see some some live footage of theirs and the way uh, Tom and um, Mike Mike, Campbell. Mike yeah I saw him play with the Dirty Knobs in L.A. Far out man he's a machine. Yeah. He's awesome. An amazing guitar player. Iron Maiden player. let's awesome. not forget Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden of course someone mentioned him down I'll give you a shout out. Three guitar here. players mm -hmm. doing the, yeah. Um, David Matai David Matai says Jack will you be making more videos for your own channel again? Greetings from Germany. Ah well that's the big question. Um, I fully intend to which is, is a horrible thing to commit to on the internet say things like that but yes I do intend to do that um, you could just lie blatantly like everyone else does on the internet that would be fine <laughs> tried that before you always get caught <laughs> out um, thank you for your interest at all but yes I um, I would like to uh, it's very nice to see um, that I've had a fair bit of support from people that like seem to like whatever it is that I do but I I just find it so difficult to come up with concepts for videos um, generally if it's by yourself 
Do you guys ever struggle with that? Do you find doing it by yourself is hard? Yeah, doing any, doing anything by yourself is is tough. Yeah, I think one of the one of the, the things fun is in the conversation. Isn't exactly. It? Yes. Because what happens and and continues to happen, which is endlessly inspiring, is that because Mick and I come from very different places musically, hmm. and the conversation just brings up amazing things to try. Mostly yeah. modal church music for me. <laughs> yeah. And seventies um, prog only for Dan. So. <laughs> yeah. Praise be. But you're, you're dead on. It's um... Only fourths. No fifths in my church music. <laughs> yeah. No, it's Raga. <laughs> he is risen. Ah. It's Raga, mate. <laughs> you're quite right, though, because especially when you're making content that is conversational with the other side of a camera, you, have, you can only push that so far yeah. before you run out of things to talk about. Um, but yes, to answer your question, I would very much like to and very much intend to. But watch well, this you're space. Always, you're always welcome to come and hang out here and do stuff. Well, thank you very much. Literally, always uh, welcome. Yep. Yeah. If I can concentrate on pointing the cameras and twiddling the knobs instead of having to do that, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be great. Um, yeah. It's a strange world making videos. It is. It really is. Siggy yeah. says, oh man, can't wait for the Johnny Meyer episode whenever I see Dan's new guitar. Johnny Meyer's this Friday. This, this coming Friday. Friday. Yeah, it's actually happening. Awesome. Um, Pippa Smith. It's Pippa Smith who said, <laughs> try Iron Maiden. Three guitarists and a bass player often well within the same tonal range as a, as a guitar. The bass that is. Sound mixing is a nightmare. Mm. Wouldn't yeah, it? I bet. wonder if you have some experience in that, Pippa. Do you do front of house for Iron Maiden, maybe? Imagine how cool that would be. Mm. <laughs> Um, run to the hills. That I think that was my introduction to uh, Iron Maiden was Run to the Hills, and I bought it on single, and it was, it was like the world opening up. Yeah, wow. Well. Because there was this sort of skinny-looking gentleman on the cover, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Young Edward. Very, very skinny. Yeah. Here, Eddie, have a sandwich. And I liked it, and I went straight out and bought Peace of Mind, I think. Right. And uh, that was that. Like many a teenage boy, lost uh, many hours to Iron Maiden. Yeah. You know... Yeah. Um, it, what's the bass player's name? Steve Harris. Steve Harris. When I first saw Iron Maiden, I thought, yeah, the guitar players are amazing, but who is that bass player? Mm. I'd never heard anyone play bass like that. He's amazing. Yeah, it's like, his band basically. Isn't it? Yeah, he kind yeah. of he he changed what I thought bass playing could be when I first heard galloping. Yeah, so just really great. Yeah, yeah. and presumably never touched a plectrum in his life. Right. I think it's all just. You must have the strongest handshake. <laughs> Be Could quite, you imagine? Be quite frightened yeah, to, to meet Steve like, Harris. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's what his that's what his handshake is. <laughs> Fishy <laughs> Harris. <laughs> He's uh, seen West Ham a few times as well. He's a massive West Ham fan. Emma's. Um Tor Olaf Lien. Tor Olaf Lien from Norway says, Thanks for being such great and inspirational legends. You've made me more passionate about my playing at the age of 51 than ever before. Only downside is you have turned me into a gearhead. Ah, oh, mate. Sorry about that. Yes, well, I won't apologise. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting. I've, I've spent... I'm going through a, a gear thing at the moment, sort of reorganising my board. Because after this, this thing with the two rock, I'm going to see if I can do the same sort of thing with the matchless. And... Yeah, we should try that. Yeah. But what was wonderful is having, you know, I've acquired a small collection of things over the years. And actually, when I wanted to try stuff, having it there to just plug it in and go, oh, yeah, mm. this in this context, this thing will absolutely work. Um, yeah, it's great. I, I love being surrounded by this stuff. It's I find it... I think because... As someone that makes this stuff, I know the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into making this stuff. Mm. And there's a story behind every single little box on this wall. That's very true, actually. Uh, and that's something that probably does get missed by a lot of people, is, especially with pedals, because it is so saturated. Uh, but that's only a, as an observer. You think about 
why someone might decide to make another tube screamer, for example. Yeah. There's probably a more considerable story behind it that's worth exploring when a brand decides to, rather than it just being, well, we're just going to have a go because that's easy. There's, pro- there's always something much deeper. Um, and it's just nice that the options are there. Totally. Totally. Uh, Mick, as a guitar mag guy, says Chris Co- Costable. Costabile, sorry, Chris. I, I'm persisting with the uh, contact lenses. I have signed up for contacts today. Uh, they are a compromise. I can just about see, uh, but anyway. Okay. They're always a compromise, but yeah. at least it means I don't have to be doing that. Yeah, mm. see, that's a compromise. Everything's a compromise. Yeah, yeah. He says, uh, anyway, Costabile, Chris Costabile says, Mick, as a guitar mag guy, looking for your reaction to the new Rolling Stone top 250 guitarist lists. Uh, serious or otherwise. Um, Chris, as a former guitar mag guy, I hate lists of all kinds. They are pure crap. And the people that put together them are hollow people who have no <laughs> life, who, of which I was one, I'm afraid. They're there to sell magazines, aren't they? Um, yeah, I mean, how do you do such a thing? I've just had a quick look at the top 10. Good to see Jeff Beck in there. Good to see Sister Rosetta oh, Tharp in there. Um, But if Eddie Van Halen isn't at number one of every one of those (laughs) polls, then, you know. 250 is an extremely odd way to... Yeah, apparently Clapton didn't make it into 250. He was 33, I think. Politics, isn't it? Oh, really? Let's have a look. I don't know. I mean... Well, a friend of mine sent me... uh, Number 250, and it was Andy Summers. Yeah, Andy Summers. Uh, So I just saw that and went, no. Is Guthrie Govan in there? He'd have to be. Is Andy Timmons in there? He'd have to be. Um, I see Chuck Berry is in. Yeah, I don't know. A load of rubbish, isn't it? (laughs) I think it's a load of rubbish. Joe James says your 100 pedalist was pretty cool, Mick. Yeah, but again, we live and learn. (laughs) <laughs> we live and learn. We live and learn. What was number one of your pedal list? Got to be the wire wire, hasn't it? I would have thought. I don't actually Probably. remember. Was the clone out by then? Uh, yeah, that was probably in there. Yeah. Right. What I liked most about that ep- um, was the cover. We did a kind of art drawing of somebody's, the bottom of a converse on a wire wire pedal. We took the picture and had it arted and it was really brilliant awesome really one of my favorite covers that wow yeah i know i'm sorry to be grumpy about it i just what do you guys think of lists best this and worst that i don't get anything done without a list <laughs> yeah but that's not like best job worst job is it because the worst job always goes last <laughs> <laughs> lists have their place don't they um i think maybe as a, a mode of discovery so if you hadn't heard of some of these people and it, it would encourage you to go listen maybe that that's a useful yeah that's actually that's that's right i remember uh when i was very young i used to buy um cds off of amazon when you were very young i know i'm I'm sorry to put that into context but but the reviews and what people thought about things and the way they would say especially if it was like a greatest hits album they'd say well this isn't as good as that one because these songs aren't on it, and the merits of this song are. And so you, you are quite impressionable at that stage, and lists do actually mean quite a lot to you. Yeah. Um, that's not to discredit them if you're not impressionable. Well, there was a time but... when lists were kind of new. That was the yeah. sort of... That was the thing, and they were interesting, And but then yeah. we just overdid them, I think. But, yeah... Yeah, or they have to be individualised, I suppose. If there's any form of opinion behind it, the opinion has to be made clear. Um, and so stuff like that, where it's categorically, this is the best list yeah, of yeah. guitar. Apparently Holdsworth's not in there, so there you go. No it, way. It's not a list. No. Um, <laughs> thanks, Chris, for uh, a great question. Um, Square Wave Symphonies, hello, and thank you so much for your amazing generosity. That is extremely kind. And everyone else who's super chatting, he says, hey, Legends. Hope you're doing well. Friday's show was a lot of fun. I need the ER2 now. How do you feel about inviting a bassist as a guest? I think Ian Allison would be awesome to have on the show. Great bassist and huge FX nerd. Much love from Alex. It would be really fun. For years, I've been uh, trying to get 
uh, Paul Turner to come on and uh, bring on um, Rob Harris. Rob Harris and the drummer. They, they, they've started a new band, which is awesome. And we'd organised it just before COVID, and of course oh. everything went horribly wrong. Mm. But would love to make that happen. The, I think that our problem is we did a show about bass effects, and we had Dishan Abrahams on. Yeah. And who was an absolute monster. Just pockets as deep as your biggest bell bottoms you've ever seen. <laughs> and Did wonder where that was going. He's, you know, really beautiful guitar sounds and, and went through all the classic bass stuff and it had like 12 views. <laughs> like oh. we had so many people asking for bass shows and I don't even think everyone that asked for a bass show watched it. Mm -hmm. Mate, I spent many years trying to publish a bass magazine, or at right. least be in, be in the publishing house that was trying to publish a bass magazine. Never. Yeah. Yeah. So it's... Well, I did, it just it, it didn't... Uh, what can we say about that? It didn't satisfy the company's requirement for enormous profit. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. And that's not to say that, that we're chasing the numbers and therefore it's not going to be highly viewed, therefore we're not interested, because it is really interesting... And there are genuine questions to ask. The problem is it's a lot of effort. Um, and because we had, Dougie was in, and we had some jams going, and it was like, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, we should get back on that. Because yeah, maybe okay. there's a way to do it in that environment. Sure. Yeah, I like I, I love listening to bass players and drummers. I listen mm. to bass players and drummers all day long. I, I much prefer that to guitarists in many ways, but just because I've done that for the last... 30 years, 25 I'll, years. Yeah. I'll, I'll reach out to Paul and Rob again and just say, let's let's put them in a diary because yeah. get them in and do and get them to come and perform people, and stuff. We've got people be, around yeah. here we could get in as well that would be easy and, oh, get Jeremy and Stacey fun. In. Yeah, why not? That'd be amazing. Yeah, get them to throw sticks at us. Um, a quick Chris Costabile says, St Vincent was ahead of Clapton, Gilmore, George Harrison and Brian May, which might be controversial. Okay, so I think what's happening there, it's not the best guitarists is it it's perhaps the most relevant question mark or it's some it's another question the mm. most um visible the most available in our uh in our conscience we've substitu what we've done is we've substituted an easier question for who is the best guitarist because you can't answer that so you substitute all other who's kinds of questions guitarist? who's popular yeah. who's relevant who's in the charts now who's changing things who's encouraging more people to pick up the guitar and that's and they're yeah, all great awesome. questions. Real great questions. Yeah, and maybe that's expanded upon in the text. Uh, so do you, do you suppose that maybe we, as more traditionally conservative guitar players, those lists aren't for us, therefore more up-and-coming guitar players, or people who are just... I don't but, think those lists are for guitar players. I think no. they're for, for people who know what a guitar is and enjoy popular music. Yeah. We, I, I had this mm. fight throughout my time on magazines. They would refer to the guitar magazines as music magazines. I'm like, no. no. They're not music magazines. They're guitar magazines. People who buy guitar magazines are into guitars. They might be into music as a byproduct, but I promise you, guitars are more important to music than music to these people. The two have mm. a very, very difficult relationship. Mm. That's so interesting. Uh, and it was, it was a point that was quite hard to get over to people who didn't play the guitar. Yeah. And that's it, isn't it? Yeah. I suppose uh, car magazines... Are about cars. They're not about driving. They're not about racing. There you yeah. go. Yeah. It, well, it's okay. about the acquisition of the But item. more people but, but, are interested in watching Formula One and yeah. etc. Case in point. Just look at these things. They're amazing. They are gorgeous. Just as works of art. Um... When I had my acoustic guitar built by Johnny Kincaid, he said he always wants to finish his guitar. Both weird. He, There's gorgeous. There, there you go. <laughs> but he says he always has, once he finishes the guitar, he always finds an excuse to have it hanging around his house for a couple of weeks. Yeah. He says, because they're beautiful things. He wants. He loves yeah, having yeah, it in yeah. the house. And anyway, yeah, they're amazing. And there, there are lots of other reasons uh, it's as, it's as valid a reason to be into guitar. I know loads of people 
who have extensive guitar collections who will come home from a really crazy day and sit down for 15 minutes and just... And that's it. They don't gig, but they <clears throat> that time that they have mm -hmm. to play, just, just to pick yeah, up this yeah, amazing yeah. thing and go be this custodian of this beautiful work of art mm. is, is, is a valid reason as any to be in these things. You see that reflected in the prices of vintage gear because it's it's not necessarily for guitar players. No. Uh, not that people who buy them don't play the guitars, but uh, working musicians, perhaps, or sure. people who classify themselves as a musician. Yeah, it's the same as as art and, and all that stuff. There's you know there's a market for it and there's supply and demand. They're mm. not they're not making um, bursts anymore. Um, so. Oh, what the, what's that old story? They, they made like a thousand bursts in the, the like three thousand in circulation. Yeah, hmm. yeah. How many bursts did they make? Was it? I want to say it's fourteen hundred and some. Maybe it was more than that. Uh, look at you playing your expensive chords. Sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. <laughs> it's a lovely thing. It's a well, lovely thing. We were just complimenting Jack on his wonderful intonation earlier. Yeah, it's lovely. You were, and that was much appreciated. Thank you. Um, um, did you, have you, did but, you study? No. No. Um, yeah, just under 1,500 I, were made. Right. Yeah. Sorry, mate. No, it's okay. Um, no, I didn't, but um, I... As I was saying to you earlier, before we started, the um, the notion now of skill and development as a guitar player the appeal is all in that stuff it's in dynamics and intonation yeah and, okay and and touch it's not about here's a lesson on how to learn to play this particular thing or this particular style um it all comes down to the interest is in just trying to be as musical as as possible nice and i suppose you can't necessarily study that or be taught that you that's your own journey isn't it to find the things that excite you musically and then yeah and playing a lot yes do you with, play a lot with people i really don't uh not anymore when i was when i was demoing guitars it, it was multiple hours sure. of the day but then i'd go home and i don't want to look at a guitar yeah sure mm. um and now really i, pl I play when i'm gigging or recording and, and i don't really play at home um, which I should, but it's I crave that context. That I think, as you were saying sure. earlier on yeah, when we were yeah. chatting, you just miss interacting with other people. That's where I think the the instrument yeah. is is useful to me. I don't get the satisfaction out of playing by myself necessarily. Sure. Yeah, I'm the same. I, there's no should about it, is there? I think if it th there's an application of some people just love playing. Dan really loves playing. Mm. Really, you really genuinely enjoy it, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I play every day. Yeah, I don't. Cup I, coffee and just right. I only I enjoy playing either when it's loud mm. and I can feel it, or if it's if there's a job, you know. So if there's yes. a gig coming up and I've got to learn the stuff. In fact, I don't learn. I enjoy that either. But um, you learn the stuff and then that's useful. And then, like you say, when you're in an ensemble. Whatever that ensemble is, even if it's just two acoustics and a bit of singing, you know, that is, it's so much more than the sum of its parts at that point. Mm. And I think that's where all that stuff you were talking about, uh, musicality, intonation, putting it across, doing the right thing to make mm. music. Um, it, that's, that's the magic for me. That is. Yeah. And, and obviously there's a million reasons you should practice, but I enjoy the spontaneity of maybe like uh, coming to you guys today i haven't played guitar for probably a couple of weeks and i thought it's going to be interesting to see what comes out mm. when i do you know when we do plug in and it will come out mate but that's the thing <laughs> that's what's interesting is is seeing what comes out yeah, yeah. Um, rather than thinking right i've got to get my got to get my chops up and and this is what i want to put across and mm. these are the sounds i want to get you just kind of go along for the ride it's an interesting debate that actually you should practice uh so there's no point me training for the Olympic 100 metres. There's no point me doing that. No. 
other than if I want to run as fast as I possibly can mm -hmm. uh, that, that, uh, over 100 metres. That's the point. And I don't want to do that. Yeah, but that's the mm. point. The point is, you say, you're never going to beat Hussein Bolt. Well, yeah, but right? I don't but, even want to be in the race. Yeah, yeah, but but if you trained, you would be faster than you would be if you didn't train. Mm. That's the thing. That is true, except I have no interest in yeah, being yeah. faster. Absolutely. And, that, and mm. that's so exactly that. About yeah. the practice thing, it's like, what do you want? Yeah. Not is the goal realistic because, well, we could have a long discussion about goals. Don't have goals, have a process. There's no point having goals. You need a process. The mm. goal is not. If you have a goal of, I don't know, being better than Guthrie Govan or whatever, you are going to fail. So don't make that. Don't make goals your the object of your work. Make the work the object of your work and have a process. That's very good. Yeah. It's nice small random. That's, I, I love that. Yeah. Goals what, are not is that, much what, use. What's that from? Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits, yes. It's about the process. The people who win have the process. Mm-hmm. Well, a goal is finite as well, isn't it? And a process is as yeah. long as you wish to make it. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you might need <laughs> to establish what you're trying to get to, but then once you've established that, forget about it, and then then you're on the process. Right. Mm. Tiny improvements every day. Mm. We do this every day. We have a decent breakfast. We, we run, run for a mile. We come back, we do 20 sit-ups and 20 push-ups. Yeah. That's how to lose three stone in a year. But you start that. That's your goal. And you go, okay, this is the process. I'm now going to forget about that. Yeah, I'm going sure. to do the process. Sure. And the process is going to be my... And I think that's the way it works with guitar. And mm. I think that's what you're saying, Dan. It, you put the work in and you improve. It's as simple as that. Yeah. I'm, I'm never going to have the feel of B.B. King. However... If I, I work at it, BB King either. <laughs> but ah. it's like I'm like okay. Uh, I think I think Alan Holdsworth is arguably he set a new when he came along harmonically, technically, tonal wise. It was a new landscape, and I'm I can play for the next million years. And I just will never have the facility to mm. do what he did. However, if I work at it and work at it, there will be elements of that that I will connect with and, and my fingers will find their way. Mm. Mm. As opposed to if I go, well, I'm just never going to do it. But it's got to be something. It, for me, it might just be a chord or a line, something I hear that's like, that's amazing. I'll sit down and, yeah, and work yeah. it out. You've, it's gotta, you've got to have that. Um, the passion for it to to want it to be part of something. Sitting like, I'll do a warm up every day just to get the fingers going, mm. but then it's just trying to play music. Yeah. And actually, Andy Wood said the same thing. I said, "How often do you practice?" He says, "I never practice." Mm. So I just play lots of music. And then Chelsea, his partner, says, "Yeah, he just plays all day. Just like mm. if it's not doing something else, he's playing all the time." Right. Wow. Yeah. And if I, that would be to a be real honest, struggle. If you know, well, Andy Timmons is the same. Yeah. To be fair. Yeah. When every so, time we were here, he had a guitar, had a guitar. in his hands. When he's at your house, when he's at my house, right? Always had a guitar in his hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting ready to hit me, probably. Yeah. Which Get end away. was he holding the yeah, guitar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's something to Maybe. be said though for you mentioned Holdsworth and that instant feeling of I can't relate to that. Mm. So. I enjoy that because then you just listen to the music yeah. and you don't have... trying to analyse it. Your analytical yeah. brain isn't necessarily fired up in the same way. But unless it just... Certain things catch your ear, like yeah. you said, and then I'll store that. I'll store that little nugget for later. But there's something nice about that. It's like listening to a great um, uh, saxophonist or a yeah. great yeah, yeah, jazz yeah. pianist or something. And there'll be a line that just takes you a slow Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's very but, refreshing for your guitar playing, actually. Mm. That's, it. That's interesting. So one of the issues I have with practice and learning and we reconstruct narratives don't we so I say I'm not interested in it because uh, I don't want to achieve that what I want to do is make music what's probably happening is a bit of ego in there where I'm going 
I don't I don't understand it and to unpick it is going to take me 300 hours that's and that is too much work yeah. so I'm going to come up with a reason Isn't why it? I'm not going to do it that's <laughs> really interesting because you do need a pathway oh. I can't imagine a journey where I'm going to be able to play those kind of endlessly flowing lines that you hear really sure. great guitar players do I can't I can't work out what the first step is much less I'm motivated enough to buy a course or actually I have done this bought true fire courses got halfway through the first lesson and gone not in a month of Sundays I've right. got to go and do the laundry right so there is we do kid ourselves a little bit about what our motivation is but and, and if it's too hard then you find a reason why it's too hard and you don't put the hours in maybe as a 12 year old you would have done your dad is on hello dad and he said if I remember correctly you once held the hundred yard time record at school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did. I, uh, <laughs> it wasn't hundred yards, Dad. It was. Uh, I had the high jump and the javelin. At, there you go. I had high jump, county, and javelin for the school. Yeah. Very did good. you jump a hundred yards? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah, cool. they just put, they put a helix on the floor, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like a cat scared by a cucumber. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I tried that with my cat. He's fine with cucumbers. Yeah, actually, I found the same. But it's um, a fun stereotype to yeah. keep alive. Uh, uh, and on this subject, Lux Phoenix. Hi, Dad. Hope you're feeling better, by the way. My dad's been a little bit under the weather. Ah. Uh, hope you're feeling better. Yeah, I hope you're feeling better, mate. He says, uh, Lux Phoenix, um, question for all three of you. How crucial is formal education for someone pursuing in a music career, making and recording their music and others? So, I don't, I think I might be the only person here that has formal studies in music. And what I would say is that, for me, it was extraordinarily, extraordinarily helpful, but more so than the, the studying was hanging around the students. Mm. I learned more from hanging around the other students who were all passionate about the same thing as I did from you know, the, the music course is now learning harmony and learning, you know, diatonic harmony and, and how to do chords and all that stuff is brilliant. It's nothing that you can't learn for internet fees on YouTube. Most important is, is finding like-minded people and actually being involved and creating something. Hmm. We would, uh, there's a guy I used to play with, and I would love to know what he's up to, a guitar player called Paul Seiler. Last I heard, he was playing in a little jazz, a uh, little restaurant, he was playing jazz stuff in Barcelona, hmm. who is still probably the most extraordinary guitar player. Up to that point, before I'd met Paul, whenever I'd heard anyone, I was like, what was I, 19? I thought, okay, I can't play that yet, but I can, I know that if I spent a long time, I'd mm. work out how to play it. Then I saw Paul play, and I I watched him play for 10 minutes, and I walked away. I had the worst headache I've ever had in my life, and like, to the <laughs> point where I was crying because it was so painful. Dream theater does that I to me. Because <laughs> I couldn't understand. It was, so, it was so beautiful what he was doing. Oh, I see. And I couldn't work out how the bloody hell he was actually doing it. Yeah, I'll yeah, never yeah. forget it. Mm. Um, and we, and we, were, we were living in the, in the student accommodation and we would just play until four o'clock in the morning like the two of us yeah. mm. it was it was amazing and so that that thing with the students is great so I, I personally think it's super helpful to know how to look at a piece of music and know what chord it is mm. um, and you know, know the idea behind outlining chords. But what I would say is unless you have a way to put that into some sort of practical uh, context, because um, I studied jazz and I didn't really start playing jazz until like 20 years later mm -hmm. because I just had no, I understood it, but I never really liked it, you know, until I started listening to, to, to my the jazz thing started broadening and until mm. I heard Pat Martino and I was like, oh my God, there oh, it okay. is. Have you heard Schofield's new record? John Schofield's got a new record out. Right. M more down the jazz 
Okay. He's done a pretty straight ahead jazz record. Right. Cool. I think you might like it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll have a listen. Yeah. yeah he, but not, you know, he's amazing, but it was, it was Pat that sort of turned my ear. Yeah. And suddenly I was like, oh, okay, there it is. Yeah. Uh, all, Jack, that's all to say it can be helpful. Uh, important formal education? Uh, for pursuing a music career? Well, I, as Dan said, it's entirely about the context. So can I ask for the, a repeat of the question for um, exactly what they asked? How crucial is a formal education for someone pursuing a music career, making and recording their music and others? Um, it's hard to pass comment as someone who doesn't have a musical education. I don't think it... It's something you need to... It, it would be like... Um, it's just a vehicle to get ideas out, isn't yeah, it? So absolutely. As you said, it's like you've learned a language, but then you sat and didn't yeah. use it for 20 and years. And I didn't read the book. Mm. So if you find that it helps you understand the context in which you wish to play music, great. Mm. If you don't think it helps you, then it will never help you. Unless you use it... It, I mean, I, I am envious of players who can, for example, get a call for a gig. There's a gig tomorrow night and you turn up to the gig and you don't know what the songs are, but yeah. okay, you can read that. And yeah. away you go. Three, four. I'm envious of that. Yeah. But equally, I've never actually had the need to do that because I've never sought that work out. Mm -hmm. So context is everything. And if, if you feel it will help you, then in the worst you can do is decide to give up on it. Yeah, I think leading on from what, from what Jack says and Dan, it, context is everything. So yeah, totally. if you're going for a job for which the entry requirements are you needed a degree in this or whatever, then yes, it's really important. Mm. But outside of that, not even slightly do you need it. Yeah. M the most successful people I know making music don't have that education. Totally. Uh, what they have is a drive to do it. Mm. So if you want a job and and you need the education, yes, if you're going to go under your own steam and you have the drive and the talent and the tenacity to do it, then no, you don't yeah. need it. But um, those people in our experience are the other side of rare. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> so, this, this is interesting. Prog Doggy says, Pat Martino, how does a person learn to be that brilliant twice? So there's a really interesting... Uh, documentary on Pat Martino. Uh, so Pat, amazing jazz guitar player, had a an illness, had an aneurysm, and then woke up. And it wasn't that he didn't uh, know who he was, but he'd forgotten a lot of stuff. Now, he the, wow. the the thing is, he didn't forget how to play guitar. What he forgot was why he played guitar. He could pick up a guitar and play it, and he knew hmm. all the stuff. But all of the motivation for him to play guitar, he couldn't remember why. Oh, wow. Why did I did I like this? And so yeah, you're like one of the world's greatest jazz guitar players. Oh really? I'm... Did he ever regain it? So he did. He came back. Yeah. And it sort of bit by bit it came back. But the the misnomer or the misunderstanding is that that he they say that he forgot to play guitar. He didn't. He remembered how to play guitar. He forgot why he played guitar. Right. Wow. And it's and. It's fascinating, this documentary. Yeah, like, he's pulling out albums, putting this stuff on and going, is that me? Yeah. Huh? yeah. No way. And they pick up a guitar and play it. And he goes, wow. And, d and did he then remember yeah, that it was Yeah, then him? he came back. And oh, then, well, okay. then he found the motivation again. And then, you know, and, you know, I, I personally, I think some of the best stuff that he did was later in life. I, you know, some of the albums from his later in career I love. Right. Um, but it is, it, they're from different places. Well, the, there's the pre-aneurysm, post-aneurysm stuff. David Burke. Hello, David. Hey, David. Nice to hear from you. David's been to one of our experience days. He says, hey, gents, uh, do you have any thoughts on the release of the Meris Mercury X, uh, LVX form factor reverb, any chance of a video of it versus the CXM? Uh, it contains some of the CXM's algorithms. Yeah. I uh, would very much like to do it. I'm just getting my head around the LVX delay and going to do a bit of a deep dive into that purely because it's such an interesting take on the delay pedal. Um, but I do, what I want to do is find 
someone who is specifically into atmospheres and textures and play and have a play with them back to mm. what we were talking about earlier what's what are you trying to achieve yeah because exactly. the scope of the thing to just let it take you seems too vast yeah i mean you could you, I, I know you're into the ambient stuff david and maybe maybe you've achieved that but I, well i just i shut down into option paralysis sure. immediately yeah and i'm like oh god just give me a if if all I've got is a nice little room reverb and a plexi and I can just play the Hendrix thing all day long, I'm happy. Yeah, <laughs> totally. My problem with those things is um, a pedal needs to be what you see is all there is or what you see is all you, is what you get, i.e. if it's not doing what it says it's doing on the top panel, to quote Duncan Bannatyne, um, <laughs> well quoted. Very good. The joy of stuff like that, I'm not familiar with that exact pedal, but... It's brand new. It's the discovery, isn't it? It's like stumbling on, oh, what the hell was yeah, that sound? Yeah. 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 So if it's capable of that quite easily, where you, you don't have to toggle through menus and stuff like that to get a sound, if you can just turn it on to but do weird stuff with the knobs... But that yeah, You can do that, but the, one of the things with the RVX is there is when you start getting into the menu and the deep dive, because you... What I found was with with almost every other delay pedal, I could hit a sound and go, okay, I understand what's going on there. Mm. I understand that there's a you know a harmony on the repeat, and that's repeating and being reharmonized, and then it's you know blah blah blah. The LVX was when I first played that, it was like I have no idea how it's doing this, and then started to look into the menu going, and then start to get a grip on it. But it is vast, um, and the reverb is the same way. But it's interesting because I just I had my um, original uh, Strymon, the the Big Sky, that I've been using for ever. Hmm. But it was broken. I just had it repaired. Just the screen had gone. I plugged that in the other day. Still sounds really good. But that's the same thing. That was like. What you can do with that, with reverb and the the choir sounds and cloud sounds, is like yeah, it's a, it's a similar thing. It's like I think we've said about Meris before. Certainly, Mercury Seven. We are the thing we just to come back to the actual question, David. The thing we love so much about the CXM is its fidelity. Yeah. Well, its fidelity in that it doesn't change your core tone. So the problem I've got with the H90 at the moment, I'm trying to learn the H90. Every time I turn it on, it fundamentally changes my core tone. So it's like, oh God. Then I've got it in, uh, put it, make it wet only and create its own loop with the dance machine. And it's like, no, nah, this is too much hassle. Hmm. The What we love about the CXM is you can just have it on your regular pedal board, turn it on and off and it doesn't... F Mess with stuff. Yes, yeah, so I nearly said the F word there because I don't want that to happen to my tone because I've got this Fuck. and I don't want this um, yeah I've got this yeah. and I have to keep it's fouling folding. and then I've got yeah. this and I don't want this and, and I am a professional we have we have made the observation uh, with the Meris stuff we've heard that it has the same quality right yeah. so the, the, the audio is well fan Fantastic. Yeah, the Meris so guys did the algorithms for the yeah, CXM. Yeah, hence the question. So there's no reason at all to think, assuming it's got analog dry through, as the obvious. Yeah, got oh, yeah, yeah, totally, through. completely. Assuming it's got analog dry through, there's no reason at all to suggest that it wouldn't be every bit as lovable as the CXM. Yeah. Every bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you can work out how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Which is. If you can power it. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so what do they take? What, what current do they take those things? Because it's not, basically two computers, isn't it? Yeah, they're not too bad. They're they're a bit hungrier than the Strymons, but they're yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, like right. six hundred or something. No, 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 no. It's like I think I think it's like just over four. Oh, okay. Not yeah, too bad. No. Yeah, fine. not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. So maybe maybe we will, David. What? As you know, because <laughs> you know us well. Sometimes, if Dan and I delve into those waters, we just get it hopelessly wrong and. All the people who really do understand it, you know. So sometimes it's just best to stay away from that stuff. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Not everything has to be for you. No, I know. That's well, the thing. Dan and I are very confident in that opinion. <laughs> <laughs>
And it is good because hopefully what you get from TPS is not what you get from every every other channel that week. Because every channel last week was about the the new Fender digital thing, and the week before that it was the Keeley Noble Screamer. Although we did do that in our own way, and the week before that it was the Ross pedal. So. Hmm. It's not to say we're not interested, but it just maybe we're not interested at that moment, and maybe we have a different question. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of expect that from us, I think. Yeah. That's all right, isn't it? Mate, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Not, sounded a bit defensive. Uh, <laughs> Brian Barrett. Hello, Brian. Hello from the PRS plant in Maryland. Hello. Hello. We believe Mr. Ooh. Anderton and uh, yes, Mr. They were. Honore were there this week. Yeah, I talked to Paul uh, a couple of weeks ago. Did you? I was down at PRS. Dropping off the um, the two boards uh, for, Simon. for Simon, and because I've never been down to the PRS place, it's like far out, man. It's <laughs> amazing. In the UK, this and, is. And um, yeah. Gavin came out, said hello to Gavin, and then he had Paul on the phone. Nice. So I had a quick chat to Paul. It was really lovely. Uh, I want you to come over here, get on a plane straight away. <laughs> Brilliant. So, hello, what a guy. Brian, and thank you for your work. He says, do you have any experience with the barefaced audio AVD speaker cabs? Thanks for all you do. Uh, not sure about the range, absolutely, but we did have two here that Joey used as his wet rig. So he had his two rock in the middle and two rev heads um, with those cabs underneath and from what i can remember they sounded great i haven't actually yep. tried them since that they're but fine but the base cab the, yo yeah the base cab, base is, cab is amazing probably brilliant we do use that in the 212 cab they use and we use that in yeah, here it's brilliant yeah with uh, either underneath that basement 70 or underneath the wallace which is an interesting marriage of tremendously old and tremendously new technology yeah but great. Yeah, yeah i think Ooh. um the, the the word is for kind of lightweight, nice design, good sound, barefaced yeah, yeah. is is where it's at. Yeah. Dan and I are still uh, emotionally attached to large and heavy speaker cabinets, so if there's any way in the world I can get a four twelve or a two twelve, it will be there. Yeah, uh, I agree. Or even um, like a two one twelves in yes. in wet dry, mm. uh, and just I don't know. You get used to your the thing that you like, and it might be that if we were doing a lot of traveling and as we get older, our backs stop working quite so well, that stuff might become more attractive, but I'd buy I'll my just, cars on the basis that yeah, you can yeah. get a 412 in If I get to that point, I think it just smother me with a pillow. I'll oh, just, oh, no, 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 I think it'll still be there, but... Yeah, or as long I'll as pay for that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll would rather pay for some of the girls to set my gear up. Like, if I get to a point <laughs> where I can't carry it anymore, I'll... Yeah, totally. Yeah, there is that. Then but the I, Tone Master will come out. Yeah. Uh, well, I figure I've been playing with my drummer for like nearly 20 years now, and he's never not turned up to a rehearsal with a full kit and a full mm. traps case and everything. As long as he's willing to do that, yeah. I'm willing to take my amp out. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever turned up to a gig, maybe with a band you don't play with that often, and you by far have the most expansive rig you bought way too many guitars you bought a pedal board that's way too big and you feel just a bit silly i've i've turned up with that and never felt silly well credit <laughs> felt to you awesome Fair I, enough. I used to do it but now i kind of i know that if it's not my band i take one amp and a small board mm. and maybe a guitar and a spare that stays out of the way in case i break a string right but if it's not my band one amp, one twelve combo, usually that one or more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, board about no bigger than that, with the four things I need yeah. on it, which is two set, two levels of overdrive, delay, something wobbly, and as long as I've got all that, no I tuner. can do anything. Yeah, tuner. But if 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 the board is so small that I have to have a headstock tuner, yeah, which just don't get me started on headstock tuners. Then I'll do that. I'll, the first, the tuner will be the first thing to go. Right. For sure. You usually end up playing your best gigs that way, don't you? With yeah. the, with with the least amount of gear. Yeah, yeah. And then when you roll out the big stuff, is if it's your gig, or yeah. If it's TPS yeah. band, or mm. if it's, and that's fine, isn't it? Mm. To 
Can we do some more TPS gigs? <sighs> I'm so I'm so desperate. Can't to even get the bloody videos out at the moment. <laughs> Okay. I do, time is in some sort of weird warp at the moment. <laughs> it's all going 58 times faster than it normally does. Andy Woods show me some new exercise that I just, I feel that I need to get out there and and, and, and show the people. I think you need oh, your own cool. band, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do sound for you if you want. I'll do front of house. That was cool though. That was like some kind of Zach Wilde uh, pentatonic-y thing. Oh, that, yeah, that's... Yeah, that, well, that was not it. Actually, the exercise he showed me, which I cannot do to save my life, because he is all alternate. Yes. Right? And so he'll take three strings mm. and go down, up, down, up, down, uh -huh. up. And then he'll go. And then. And then change it. And then he'll go. And then pop the, the fourth one. The fours. But he, he, alter, he um, hybrid picks the fourth, doesn't he? Yeah, hybrid picks okay. the fourth one. Yeah, yeah. There's, this is all coming up in the video, by the way. Right. And it's like, and and I'm saying, oh, that sounds like too many notes. He goes, oh, yeah, too many notes, which is the Steve, uh, Morse. Steve Morse thing. And he just, off the top of his head, <laughs> nails it. No, yeah. I just couldn't. Like, How his many... facility is, is ridiculous beyond words. Yeah. How many hours yeah. of that do you think you would need to do in order to have it down and be able to use it musically, I, I don't. I could, I think I could do a million years, and my hands wouldn't do it. I think I'd so get to a keep point. Going with it then? Yeah. Right. Even though there's going to be no result. No, there will be a result. I won't be able to do too many notes. Oh, I didn't mean that. I meant the the picking technique. Oh, y yeah. So, what I've discovered, and this is a big thing for me, right? Because I've I was on the Eric Johnson thing for a while, trying to do that. Yeah. And I discovered that when I try to do that, I my timing is off because I don't have an anchor. However, if I'm doing the alternate thing, and there's always a downstroke, mm. then the upstrokes are all off beats. <laughs> and there's always a, I can always keep the thing. When what Andy was saying was, it all comes from. That, that the the country listen to that thing go yeah that's awesome. cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah Come on, Johnny but that but that and that and that translates in that bluegrass style yeah um yeah I I saw a video of Molly Tuttle and I then I thought I couldn't I was watching her right hand going that's just unbelievable so she got from this she's probably bluegrass player, mm. this really amazing bluegrass rhythm, and then she'd go into the fieriest, most amazing lead thing. It's all economy though, isn't it? And I don't mean economy picking, I mean the economy with which they approach it. There's no yeah. kind of efficiency, wild flailing. And oh yeah, no, no. The, it's like... It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's incredible. Yeah, it's yeah. incredible. So yeah, oh, okay. I'm, I'm really... Nice. Uh, yeah. I look forward to hearing some of that on the show, Daniel. Indeed. As do I. Right, um, we might have to speed up a bit. So, uh, entirely my fault. Oh, no, it's this, I'm having a really Partially wonderful chat. It's lovely. I thought it was my fault. Yeah. Well, I'll take we, it. I'm, look, it's I'm the variable. Yeah. I think we should accept shared responsibility. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just some more than others. <laughs> um, Albus Band, Aaron, hello, G'day, mate. mate. Great to hear from you. He says they're just experimenting with some new packaging materials. <laughs> <laughs> Experimenting? Are they having monkeys open it or what? <laughs> Thank you for the continued uh, uh, inspiration. He says, hello, Leggins. Name a food you want to love but can't. For me, it's raw seafood. Mm. Oh, no, I love raw seafood. Um, can, I, can a drink be involved? Guinness. I, I think it'd be oh. pretty easy to convert you to Guinness. No, I have tried. I went to Dublin. Because I love the look of it so much. Yeah. And every time I've drunk it, it's like drinking Vegemite. And, and and someone says, oh, it doesn't travel well. And I said, right, teen, before we had the kids, right, we're, we're going to Dublin. Went to Dublin for a weekend, mm. went to the place they make the Guinness, mm. and sat down and went, this is going to be amazing. No, it still tastes awful. This is a great example of system one heuristics and biases. But I want to like it. I'm going to blind <laughs> test you with it. Okay. And with a really good milk stout, and 
even though Dan and I can't drink beer anymore, it makes us too sad. But um, maybe, <laughs> maybe that would be good to film. Um, <laughs> There's a show. Yeah. <laughs> Too sad. Yeah. Like, too sad. Okay. Properly, it makes me properly depressed, right. unfortunately, which is really, it's the weirdest trigger. I drank some um, it was a nice milky style. Yeah, I want to do a blind test, because I think your system one is telling you that it tastes thick. It actually, it, to me anyway, Guinness tastes less thick than a lot of the modern IPAs, which you quite like, mm. the hopped IPAs. Okay, I'm, I'm up for it, because right. I would love... See, like now it. that's the kind of blind test I could get into. Yeah. <laughs> Repeating it over and over and over. <laughs> that, oh, the TPS on, blind you, test. You... We'll get goggles and everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Beer goggles. Yeah, uh, 24 hour amazing. beer blind testing. Awesome. Are, you, are you a beer person? Do you like beer? I do. I yeah. do like beer, yeah. And I, I do like Guinness, but it, it does have a unique taste. Yeah. Uh-huh. But I agree, it, it is probably possible to overcome it. Your your dislike of it. Oh, you're fine. Yeah. But so then, tastes... what do you stand to gain by doing that? Yeah. What's the goal? Yeah. So I. What's well, your... I'd love to be able to say on the occasion, the rare occasion that I have a beer, like St Patrick's Day, for example. Yeah. That yeah. I'd have a Guinness, but at the moment, yeah. I simply cannot abide it. It's like. <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Maybe we'll try milk stout tonight with meat feast. See how depressed we can be tomorrow for the pedal board build. <laughs> yeah, see how bloated I can make my face. Uh, so yours is Guinness, a food that you would like to you would like to like but can't. The raw seafood is hard to. Yeah. Well, since that was the example listed, I can't get it out of my mind now. Yeah, that's a, um, um, a bit of system one. Um, what's the word? Bias. No. Yeah. Well, bias, but it's a particular type of bias. It's called anchoring. Oh. Ah. Yeah. So. Uh. In a negotiation, for example, uh, someone will always anchor the price high or low. That's how anchoring works. Okay. And then your your variance of of your extent of variance from the anchor will only go so far uh, because of the way it is how negotiation works. But there's all kinds of other anchoring devices like that you wouldn't believe. Like if somebody shows you a picture of a fridge freezer and then asks you to. Um, uh, and you know this, by the way, and asks you to uh, guess the temperature f- for the next week. You'll be colder. You'll say it's colder because you've seen the fridge freezer. Okay. Yeah. Etc. That's probably a very mm. bad example, but um, yeah, because he said uh, raw seafood, that's anchored, and that's all you can think about. What you see is all there is. Is another term. Well, I subscribe to that because that's all I can think about now. Yeah. I'm even starting to taste it, and I'm not. Yeah. What would be your worst kind of raw seafood? Um, oysters. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah. Oh. Dan's like, a fan of oysters. Oh my word, they're amazing. I don't know if I, yeah. I, I like the idea of them and I like the ceremony. I'm not sure. Okay. That's it. Love okay. The taste. Right. I'll I like do the, the Guinness. Idea. Yeah. And you guys can do the oysters. Yeah. Because I'm I'm positive I could convert you to to oysters. I've had them in good restaurants, you know, with a nice bottle of pig pool. But I think it's about the theatre as much as it, I'm not sure I love the taste. Okay. Do you love the taste? I love the you taste. You do? Yeah, I do. Yeah, mm. yeah. How are you generally with seafood? Very good. Yeah. I've grown up on it. Yeah. I've been fishing my whole life. I love it. Like that fishing to eat then. food, to eat yeah. the fish. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, what would mine be? Um, I like most food. I'm Nick's like... a very good cook. You'll, you'll experience this later this evening. He's an amazing cook. Um, I reckon that would have been... You could have been a, a, a really good chef if you had so if you had it so chosen. If that had been your passion, you would have been amazing at it. I can imagine. You and you can the focus confirm for that for me. You can confirm that later. Maybe, the maybe, maybe some of the cooking side, but the temperament and management. You would have been a abilities. perfect chef, throwing fucking pans around and <laughs> knives and stuff. It'd be, be brilliant. <laughs> That'd be me and Marco Pio White, wouldn't they? Oh, what a guy. <laughs> Have either of you watched The Bear? No. The new, uh, newish show on Not the on cocaine Disney. bear? No, no, no. Okay, because I watched that now and that's that was different. brilliant. <laughs> no, all about the inner workings of a very intense kitchen. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, and it just it makes you hungry and appreciative that you don't live that kind of life. Right. But also appreciative for the people who do so that you can eat amazing food. Yeah. 
Sorry, Mick, I know we're supposed to. We should give that a go. Um, yeah, so they've said seafood. He said Guinness, you said seafood. Um, I don't know what mine is, because I, I like you said oysters. pretty much everything. No, I because I do, I don't mind oysters. I, okay. I'll happily eat them. I don't love them, but I don't not like them. Ah, uh, what about food pretending to be meat? Uh, yeah, but again, I don't dislike it. Okay. I don't dislike it. I think I like all food. Mm. Um, yeah. How are you with sprouts? Yeah, yeah, I love sprouts. Okay. As long as you cook them right. If you um, uh, sauté them with a bit of bacon, wonderful. Cauliflower cheese is another answer. You don't oh, have absolutely love cauliflower detestable cheese. substance, but it's a, if any time you have a great roast, it's always there, and you think I would but like to. Do you to like the elements? Do you like cauliflower? And do you like cheese? I do actually. Yeah. So it's it's one of those weird macaroni cheese is another one. You can't. It's too much of a good thing maybe. Do you have a pasta bake? Do you have a problem with cheese? I do. Yeah. Hot yeah. cheese in general, or just like hot pizza? Okay. Pizza's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing wrong with hot cheese. Just try uh, it. Camembert. Just try you know. Jackson is hot cheese. That's that's me. Coming at you. The cheese boy. Um. Yeah. Sorry, that one just came to mind. Uh, oh yeah, David Diebold says peas, porridge, maybe haggis. Uh. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I would say put some offal. I'm not a fan of really seriously heavy offal. So tripe. Um, those sausages you get in France that have got the ventricles and everything in them. Okay. Not, you know, just not a massive fan of that. Don't want to like it. The first time I had haggis was in Edinburgh. Oh, I don't mind haggis. Don't mind haggis. Yeah. And I... Because I was having the most amazing time and I fell in love with Edinburgh. Mm. And I was like, give me haggis. And it was am it was awesome. But I was in the headspace to love it. Yeah. They kind of It almost didn't matter what they'd, they'd brought out. I was having such a great time. But I had, I was in Lyon. We went to see... Um, uh, Radiohead. No, no. Went to see... Uh, Catherine Deneuve. No, um, Led Zeppelin... Um, uh, Robert Plant. Robert Plant. I'm just thinking of the of the meme. Robert Plant's Robert Plant Plant based orders. food. Um, I went to see Robert Plant, and we went to this restaurant. We were staying at the hotel, and this and I said, "I've never been here before. I want to. I want some really authentic. Tell me to go where the locals go." Mm. Went to this restaurant. A little hole in the wall. They had all these benches, and you just sit down at these benches, and then all of a sudden. These people came and sat right next to me. Within five minutes, every spot on the bench was full. And then they just start bringing out these bowls of stuff. Mm. And you just start... And that, and it was the most amazing food. And I'm eating this stuff and I'm going, this is amazing, what is it? It's awful. Right. It was beautiful. And you said, yeah, I think but it, it was be awful too. Yeah. It, was, it, <laughs> it, it was a specialty of that region in Lille. Yeah. Um, so it is a, like... A, that stuff is born from we're starving. What else can we eat? Yeah. And well, find also a way to make using it work. the whole animal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily starving, but we're yeah, yeah. Oh, brains. Okay. Uh, brains. Can't yeah. Do brains. Tom Woodworth. I'm yet to brains. try it. Not great. Yeah. No, I've never had them. I'm sure it'd be all right. Like chicken, apparently. Uh, we really should get back to the. Sorry. Excellent. Can I say that's why this show is great? Because. <laughs> How much gear talk has there actually been and how much food talk? And brains. We're onto brains now. <laughs> Paul Har Harrington. Hi, Paul. Paul says, uh, I want to shout out Vernon Reed for trying to bring some recognition to guitar legends, Robin Trower, Ernie Isley, Mike Stern, Elliot oh, Easton, yeah. and others. Can you talk about honouring history as we chase the new? Um, I, I don't know if you're new here, Paul. We We don't talk about new very much at all we tend to only talk about history because we're all farts well, we're, and... we're very inspired there's th those sounds that i'm sure everyone's the same here but there's a reason that we all play guitar it's not because we picked up guitar one day and just magically played a chord and went this is amazing it's because we heard mm. sounds that these legends made and we thought mm. you know why is that connecting with me there's something going on there and yeah, the, these are pioneers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but yeah, thanks for the shout out. Uh, nice to hear about Vernon Reed too. We saw him at Nam uh, a couple of years ago. I think I 
Did I see him this you, year? Probably. Vernon Reed was walking past, and Mick goes. No, he went. What did he? What? How, how have you play it? And Vernon just turns around and goes, "Okay, <laughs> it was great." It was the big hit nice. that Living Colour had. It was called Love Rears Up Its Ugly Head, and it was ah, that's it. So I'm stepped down, so it would be, oh uh, yeah. I played this in so many bands. Yeah. And there was that great wah wah, wah solo. Very good. Oh yeah! So it earned you an oh yeah. It did. Cool. I remember on the uh, sort of tour of British and American army bases when I was 17, 16, 17, and uh, they uh, Times Up had come out, and then they did they'd done another record, which I think was an fu to their their record company Virgin. Oh, okay. Which had loads of bonkers covers on it, like um, "Burning of the Midnight Lamp," and and that was our soundtrack on that tour. We oh, put wow. we put stereo speakers in our van <laughs> <laughs> and an extra power amp, I think. And, yeah, God, fond days they were. Cool. Really, fond days, and uh, get having a gun pointed at you all the time, which was another part of it. Uh, Pressure is good. I'll be a Floyd. I'll be at the Floyd Rose booth for Winter Nam, says Scott Gaylor. Oh, cool. Will I see either of you fine gents at the show? I, probably not, because Dan's going to have just come back from Australia. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure we'll do now. I think we might do some other things. Yeah, there's a couple of things that I would love to do. But I think I think Winter Nam's probably going to be a stretch this year. But maybe... Maybe, yeah. Maybe, we, may, yeah, we'll see. Sometimes we sort of decide at the last minute and, and just go... But, um, would be good to see you, Scott. You, um, I saw your Scott's doing some more videos now, and he's an amazing player. Um, so yeah, well done, mate. Eagle Ray cool. Rob, he says, Thanks for the Kingsley introduction. I just opened my Juggler version three and running it into an effects return of a Victory D140, uh, V140, with an EV 1x12 EV paired with a little Walter, which is a 53 baseman. Uh, 266 CTS Alnico 10s. What a lovely noise. Big I bet that is amazing. Yeah, we're, we're big fans of the Kingsley stuff. Mm. Uh, but, but again, you know, all about context. At the last experience day, uh, we were both waxing lyrical about how much we loved the juggler. Somebody really wanted to try it, plugged it in. Not for them. Didn't like it at all. Oh, yeah. right. um, I think that speaks as much about it's such a versatile thing like we always used to say about Mark series boogies you know mm. there was 99 rubbish sounds in it and one really well, good one yeah, well, actually, yeah. <laughs> 96 rubbish sounds and four really brilliant ones which differed per player right so what was good for you wasn't necessarily good for somebody else and I think that's the case of Simon stuff in something like the juggler version 3 it is so packed with interesting things it's not hard to take a wrong turn as it were but um, glad you're loving it Rob I love it big time what, what's the biggest disappointment you've ever had with gear where you were so hyped up for it to be your thing and then you got, hey, oh no, I just can't make it work for me. Line 6 duo tone. Right. I was all ready to make the jump uh, and it looked like a proper amp and I took it to a gig and I was like, nope. Right. I was ready. I was totally ready. And I um, also had a Variax. I thought, this, this is it, really? This is it. They were like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a in, shame. But as for, like, something that I should really like, I don't know. Um... Not meaning to, you know, get you to try and discredit something. But... No, I do, well, we're quite happy doing that because we, <laughs> we know it's all personal. And yeah. what one person really loves, the next person really... The Super Reverb has been a bit of a disappointment. The Super Reverb really? is the most extraordinary amp at a very specific At six and spot. a half. Yeah. Oh, okay. Either Outside side of that. is just 
No, just meh. But but we should change the speakers. That might sound yeah, a bit better. Yeah, yeah. You know, compared to Matt Schofield's '64 Super Reverb, for example, which just sounds like it's angels like, yeah, breathing the, the and Lord then shouting. made an amplifier oh. and fairly gave it to thee. Yeah, it's amazing. Have you? What, what about you? Um, nothing springs to mind. I think I kind of got in the habit of forcibly finding something good mm. in a piece of gear. Because especially if you have to demo it, you think, okay, well, I need to find this thing pretty quick and then try and put that across. But for my own, maybe in it, having done that, that was my elimination process of getting rid of the things quite quickly. That So I never had that sense of disappointment that I went out and bought something maybe and thought, sure. oh, no, I really wish I hadn't spent the money on this. Yeah. Um, I was in quite a fortunate position to be able to, the elimination rounds happen very quickly. Yeah, yeah, because um, yeah, we we are in a we are in a very lucky place there, aren't we? I do remember buying my first ever twin reverb, and I was would have been fourteen, I guess, mm. and it was a hundred and thirty five watt. You know, it was the big um, CBS. Was it the Red Knob era? No, be just before that. Oh right. So the Red Knob may well have been out by then, but I was buying second hand ones, and bear in mind the internet didn't exist. I was probably 14 years old and couldn't really afford guitar magazines. So I had seen a picture of Stevie Ray Vaughan playing Fender Amps. So I thought, well, it must be that one. Mm. Bought it, got it into the band rehearsal, turned it up to seven and went, oh, <laughs> no, it's definitely not that sound. Mm. And then promptly went out and bought two yellow overdrive pedals. Oh, wow. And then that worked. Brilliant. So I do remember that being disappointing. And then yeah. I do remember getting rid of my uh, Mark III, because it was too loud and too directional. Actually, it wasn't too loud, it was too directional with the 112 EV. Getting a Mark IV and not loving it as much. Mm. And then thinking, okay, what I'll do is get a DC5 50 watt and a 412 cab. And that was just not loud enough at all. That was very disappointing. Mm. Yeah. See, mine was my first tube screamer. Right. I'd heard these. Your first heavy, and last. Yeah, my, my these heavy rock guys had played it, and this, and I, I knew it was legendary. And I, when I first got, first had the uh, like realization about pedals, went down to Guitar Crazy and Kuji, took a, got a credit card, and I bought a C1 Electric Mistress, a Phase ninety, and a Tube Screamer. And they were all amazing, except the Tube Screamer. And I just. I just couldn't connect with it. Right. Um, but then I found a thousand other overdrives I could connect with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I hear I hear Mick play a tube scream and it's like, it's it's extraordinary. But it's just I I can't play like that. I those no, I don't have those notes. Give me a blues driver that has a larger yeah. frequency spectrum. Yeah. And I can sort of integrate it with my app a bit differently. And it's like, yeah, I'm I'm happy. I suppose it's the context with which you discover those things. If you discover totally. it yeah, yeah, yeah. from hearing Mick play it or, yeah, yeah. or something at a later point, then maybe you would have found the way that... Because who did you hear playing a oh, tube screamer to well, that was, make you think you wanted it? Um, it was Stevie Ray, but it was like when I first... Because I, I had racks of stuff and pedals were so passe. And then I started working with this producer and I played a mistress and lost my mind. And he, and he started going through the pedals that I had to have. And, says, and you, one of them was that you have to have a tube screamer. Right. And so went down and got it. And it was like, I just couldn't make it work. And it very much might have been the rig that I had at the time. But I was also, because I was playing it, I was playing, what was I playing at the time? But I think I still had my, I had a 64 Strat that was stolen. But it had no middle pickup. I only had the bridge. It was like I had a three-way switch in it, mm -hmm. a bridge that, like you know, wired like a telly. All oh, right. Um, but yeah, I just couldn't. Oh, I, had, I was also using the Music Man app at the time, which is solid-state front-end valve power section, mm. and the, it was just too much for it. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. It's no. It, it, yeah. It, it, you're right about context. When and where it totally changes the your experience of something. 
I would never have got a clon if I didn't understand that that's what Grissom yeah, was okay. using to boost his marshals and what John Mayer was using to put the mids back in his mid scoop, scoop damps right. in a particular way. If you aren't chasing either of those sounds or many of the other sounds that you know that it was used in being part of, then you'd have plugged it in and gone, well, I don't get this at all, which mm. I probably have done with loads of other pedals and, and guitars. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay, quick fire round. Yeah, we do need to, a little bit of a quick fire round. Sorry, I deviated from that. We are going to be question. eating at about nine o'clock at this point. Okay. Um, which is fine, which is fine. Uh, hi, M and D and gang. First time Super Chatter here. Thank you, hey, mate. Thank El you. Cameroni. Uh, El Cameroni, I learned tons about gear, music and humans on this channel. But mm. who is your favourite bass player and your favourite bass sound? Love and peace from Luke. Um, I've got two. Anything James Jameson ever played, ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, uh, and uh, uh, I've got to mention Pino alongside that, but James Jameson, anything James Jameson played ever yep. in that classic pantheon of soul music. Yep. And moving forward from that, once the octave down and a bit of chorus starts appearing on bass in stuff like Shaka Khan and that. Mm. and I don't I don't know who played the bass on that. So okay, yeah, um, Anthony Jackson, uh, astonishing. Um, but my my favorite bass sound and it's probably really dated now. But do you remember the band that had that song? Um, once there was this kid who couldn't care to crush test crush dummies. Test dummies, and on their debut album, the bass sound on that blew my mind. Right, it was astonishing. Hmm. Given the timing, it probably was some kind of Warwick and a something. Yeah, yeah, maybe I don't know. But that that, that yeah, that was a bass sound. Actually, I when when I normally hate five string basses, but when five string basses turned up in like Erica Badu. Okay. And that era of soul. Like... The bass playing on that live record, Erica Badu live record. If you haven't heard it, get it on now. It's just mesmerising. Is he a strangler? Oh. Hmm? Um, I haven't <laughs> seen any visuals of it, but oh, okay. I would have thought so. Yeah. And, and anyway, does, sorry, uh, Air bass does work better. Ba uh, again, you put the idea of Pino in my head, so so there he is. Geddy Lee as well. I think that's just such an awesome. Anything. Why does he sing so high? <laughs> Why about the voice of Geddy Lee? Why does he sing so high? Who was that? I can't pavement? join in here. Is it Pavement or President's United States? Of America? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Sorry, it's a lyric from a song. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Ronnie Wood as well as a bass player oh, in wow. the Jeff Beck group. Wow. Awesome. Good. So you, you, if you're talking about Geddy and you're talking about that, more mid forward. Yeah. Bit of overdrive on it, maybe. Yeah, I like. Uh, not to be overly specific, but I like bass players in trios because you can really hear everything. Yeah. They, they kind of have to spread a little bit wider, I suppose, what they're doing yeah. vocabulary-wise. And those are just the ones that come to mind as being notable as a guitar player, notable bassists that I. Oh, what's the What's the band who played the South Park intro? Primus. Primus. Yeah. I mean, I hit... Man. Les Claypool. Les Claypool. Yeah, yeah. Just... I mean, there's no... It's not the notes. It's mm -hmm. just the... It's just the sound that it's he the makes. Intent. It's the Oh, man. It's yeah. awesome. Some serious bass playing on um, <laughs> Luther Vandross's first album as well, Marcus Miller. Yeah, oh, Marcus yeah. Miller. Um, St astonishing. Yeah, obviously, it's Luther, so he's the star, but the bass playing is the star of that record. Yeah. Tell you, I, I love Sting's bass playing. Yep. Yeah. Just, yep. a, just so beautiful. And right so with you perfect on that. Perfect for the Right song. with you on that and yeah. tonally. Yeah, yeah. Just perfect. Scott Gaylor, nice nice quote, Scott. He says, but you can't use my phone, which is a lyrical quote from that Erica Badu record. <laughs> uh, nice. Jack Bruce, Andy Frazier. Yeah. yeah. Jacko. Oh, yeah. Jacko. Obvi obviously, Jacko. Obviously, a very specific thing, but. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's let's let's. Uh, Quick fire round. 
Evening, gents, says Dark Sign Hunter. I'm sitting down with my... what we've been calling Rosie Watch. She's always hoping for a glimpse of the elusive Spaniel. My girlfriend, sorry, sitting down uh. with my girlfriend. Uh, well, hopefully a little glimpse of Rosie early on kept you uh, Spaniel to the max. <laughs> <laughs> that, that should be her, her Rosie... Okay, Spaniel to the max. Yeah, yeah, maximum Spaniel. Thank you, Dark Sign Hunter. Uh, mm -hmm. Jerry Olney, hi Jerry. He says, hi Dan, Mick and Jack. Do you have any amps, do you know any amps that do a Fender, Black Panel, Bassman, Sound or Circuit for less money than a vintage one? Uh, the new Deluxe Reverb is fantastic. Hmm. We use it all the time. It takes a little bit of uh, playing in but once you play it in, it's great. It's that mid sixties thing is so interesting. Uh, do you remember when we were in Madison Square basement with Mike? Yeah. Analog man. Yeah. Mm. And I'm pretty sure that's the amp I was playing there. Right. And we've since bought a, a later version, a silver face basement 70, which is not the same thing, but it's that lovely, loud, clean platform mm. has some things in common. If you get it at the right era, you can mod it back if if you want to hit, nail it right on. But because, the you know, the mid 60s black panel stuff is crazy money now, especially if it's in good condition. Yeah. Um, so certainly the later 60s stuff, because there was a period of transition when they go to the silver panel where they get further and further and further away from what we now know to be those magic amps. And it might be that there's a period in there somewhere that works for you. That thing sounds great. Yeah, yeah. 78 that is. Yeah. And it, it sounds really killer. It doesn't it doesn't really do the black panel thing, but yeah. it's a lovely, loud, clean presentation. You you can also find some of the old Sovtech MiG fifties that are based around the old basement yeah. as well. And and they can sound really good. I used one for years and they're, they're great. Yeah. And you can pick those up, you know, quite cheap. Yeah. So it's a crapshoot, isn't it, vintage amps, because you've got to be prepared. But if you are prepared and you know someone, it's amazing what you can get eke out of, them. Eke out of something yeah. relatively cost Because they're so easy to work on. Yeah. yeah. Some yeah. of modern reissue amps, though, they're also a crapshoot. Because like you've talked about before, your particular deluxe yeah. is radically different to other reissue deluxes. Yeah. And the same applies to vintage amps. So it depends what kind of black panel sound you're chasing. What you're after, yeah. Oh, this um, is nice. Sorry. Uh, Jeff McCurlain has been hello, in touch. Jeff. He said, uh, big thanks, guys. I've been messing around with TPS wet dryer. Sounds great and easy. Awesome, mate. Nice one, Jeff. I did get your email as well. Apparently, Robin Ford has moved to London. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, uh, I'm going to London more often then. Maybe we can reach out. Um, well, that's a very strange move. Uh, I don't want to... I'm going to say that there's only one reason you ever move anywhere. Lady love. Lady love. Oh. <laughs> Could be then. It's the only reason anyone ever ever emigrates anywhere. Yeah. I. Yeah. Unless it's uh, a job might might be another reason, but usually it's lady love. Or being lady on the love. run, which I don't think probably applies no. to. <laughs> or any kind lady of love. love. It doesn't have to be lady. Uh, <laughs> just it is 2023. Um, yeah, and there have been some amps, Jerry, down the years from Fender that emulate that sound. Uh, the Supersonic, I believe, has uh, quite a good version of that sound mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. You can pick those up for pretty decent money used. Uh, to be fair, a lot of the a lot of the other Fender tube amps down the years can do a pretty yeah. half decent version of that sound. Yeah, a lot of it has to be, um, sometimes the sound is there, but you don't necessarily know what to do with the sound to yeah. make it sound, I don't know if that quite makes sense, to it make does. it sound like the representation of the sound that you have in your mind. Yeah. Um, comes back to that thing of like, you, okay, all the components are in place, I'm playing an amp that does the thing, but I don't know how to make it do the thing. And I'm not implying that yeah. the person asking that question doesn't know what to do, but... There might be other brands as well that, to know what you that want to are out less with. available in the UK that are available to you in the US. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there were PV this and that. I don't know if the Juice does that kind of sound. But there's so there were so many amps 
through the late 70s and 80s that were, you know, look for 6L6 power tubes, look for a clean kind of presentation. You're never a million miles away from it, especially if you employ an EQ pedal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as long as it's loud and clean and, mm. yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, Victor Gustafsson. Hello, Victor. Hey, mate. Nice to hear from you from Sweden. He says, Dan and Mick, thanks a million for introducing me to Wet Dry. A Gretsch 6154 paired with a Deluxe Reverb 68 using C2 as a split and a Vibe after the split and OD before Vibe. Lovely. Amps are quite clean. Uh, where would you place a Humdinger in this setup? Uh, you would just stick it at the end of one of the chains. Sorry, let me say that again. You use it to split. Yeah, use it as your split. Use it as your split. So the isolated out would go to your dry amplifier, giving you isolation and phase reverse reversible capability. Yeah. Phase reversing capability from the Humdinger. The issue you might have is because you're using the CE2 as a split, you want that split of wet and dry from the C2, which is giving you real chorus, right? Because down one side you get vibrato and down the other side you get nothing. So the two amps together are giving you the chorus. Mm. So if you employ the humdinger before that, it means you won't get that. Yeah. Um, so it might be that you put the humdinger immediately after the chorus. Or you put it, yeah, or you put it uh, at the end of the chain that's going to the dry amplifier. Yeah. Go into the humdinger, isolate it out of the humdinger into the dry amplifier. So then you, you still got your proper chorus uh, vibrato clean split but you'd still got the isolation and the phase reversing going into the second amplifier and the phase reversing is so critically important because the c2 won't change the phase so you should be correctly in phase out of the two and actually it doesn't matter because there's no dry signal present in one but by the time you hit those two amps either the amp itself a speaker cab could be out of phase so you do need to just check the phase uh, so have the as exactly what he just said, Humdinger on one side, and you'll be able to do that. Hmm. Can I just jump in and thank you for something, actually, Dan? Because there's something you flippantly mentioned in a video once right. about the EP booster that yeah. that it flips the phase. Yes. And I was uh, at home running two amps, and I could not solve a phase issue, and that did it. Just turn go. it on on just you know just before the input of one particular amp. Doesn't, don't have to use the boost, just turn it to minimum. But it was I couldn't believe it worked. There you go. And it did. There you go. Does it flip phase on the EP boost? Yep. So it's not an issue if you have the EP boost first, right? Yeah. Because then it's yeah. the phase is relative. But if you split the signal and have the EP boost, then it's like, ah. Mm. But it's a perfect, in that particular use case, and it may not work for every pair of amps, but it, it solved the issue. Yeah. There you go, great. Sounds very cool. Uh, the Juggernaut says, this is just for having Jack on the show. Cheers. Ah, oh, thank you, mate. That's kind of you, Juggernaut. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juggernaut. A great name. <laughs> Dan Sokolowski. Dan Sokolowski. Hello, Dan. He says, I got my first Gibson Les Paul Jr. What's your favourite tone tip or trick with a single P90 guitar? Thanks for the great content. Okay. So... They're just the best, aren't they? They unfortunately are. <laughs> that guitar is crazy. It's crazy. Mm. So, <clears throat> one thing that is amazing with these guitars is the clean tone. Yeah. We're rolling the volume back and then rolling the tone back. You'll find a spot and it's 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 almost like an acoustic guitar. It can almost be like an acoustic yeah, guitar. It's, it's so weird. It's, it's, it's really amazing. So... That's a really great thing. Um, you know, the volume control. You just... You can get so many amazing tones out of this guitar by just manipulating these two. Mm. But the, the best tip I can give you is just all the way up and just rock out because they're, they're very, very special guitars. Mm. Jack? They really make you understand what your hands are doing because you have nowhere to... So if you're doing it, like if you were, went out and did a cover gig and you only took that guitar, for mm -hmm. example, you have to do everything here, here and here. And you can. Obviously with pedals as well, but... And you, you absolutely can, because the guitar has such a strong 
mid-range identity, mm-hmm. everything is super revealed. So it, it does. I think it genuinely can make you a better guitar player because Absolutely. you hundred percent you figure out more about your own playing yeah, yeah. in the process. Um, that might be a bit of a wishy washy no, answer. No, no, but no, it's, no, it's no, no, no. I totally, totally agree, answer. and it's why everyone should have one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would say uh, more volume, less gain. Thank you very much. It, one thing about P90s, this one takes gain really well. A lot of modern P90s, certainly in my my Collings Junior, it can compress too much when you get the gain up there compared to a Strat or a Tele. So I always think more volume, less gain, and then use this as your gain control. Yeah. Where do you stand on uh, Esquires versus... Gibson style single pickup. I've never had an Esquire long enough to be able to. Okay. Um, but I would be equally happy. The with, principle is kind of the same. Yeah, I mean, all the tellies I've ever had, I pretty much never use a neck pickup anyway, mm. so I'm very happy. Whereas the neck pickup is such a big part of why I love. Yeah, yeah. Especially this one. So yeah. you'd never go for an Esquire? No, because I've got this. Yeah. This, I don't. That's the sound I want yeah. if I want a single back thing. There is something yeah. about this makeup of guitar now i know that there are people out there who say it's only the pickup it's my experience that this combination of one of these kinds of pickups a very slim mahogany body and a slim mahogany neck or mm. you know whatever <laughs> the fact is they are all that so that's a, that's the the formula we're dealing with has a particular kind of mid-range yeah. that you can't get out of an esquire or yeah, some totally. other single pickup guitar there's something about yeah. this formula Again, you know, try that on an Esquire where you turn the volume and tone down, if you can find that position on the switch, <laughs> um, <laughs> or if it's wired that way, uh, and you don't get that pseudo acoustic guitar thing. No. That, that really only happens on these, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, true. Yeah. Plus, Johnny Thunders is one of the coolest guitar players <laughs> of all time, and uh, he made it work. I just, oh, it's such a, it. it You've seen enough of that. Put it um, away. Uh, and last in tonight, Chris Turner. Chris, thank you uh, for super trying. He says, um, I just picked up a Yamaha LL16 from Peach, inspired by Jack's demo. Oh, ah. cool. He says, my wife yeah, wasn't they were great. Happy. My wife wasn't happy, so how does Jack feel about ruining my marriage? <laughs> <laughs> I presume you're talking about the guitar. I, I didn't have anything to do yeah, with your yeah, marriage. Yeah, well, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, but enjoy the guitar. We have, um, we do have quite a lot of TPS widows, as it were. Um, <laughs> usually it happens at a guitar show or somewhere public where they'll, I'll see a beaming face on a gentleman and then a lady next door will be like, it's you. <laughs> I, I had that when I went to see Midnight Oil <laughs> and I uh, was talking, it was, uh, oh, yeah. Invited along, they were here and doing their last ever tour, and I'm a big Midnight Oil not all fan. And um, Jim and Jeannie and, and Martin were there, and we got to meet them, and they're so lovely. And, and um, Martin says, I just I want to say thank you for the, the videos of lockdown, they, they were, they were really amazing. I'm like, Oh, really? <laughs> you know, so my mind being blown, and then <laughs> and uh. He said, oh yeah, I especially love the one with the acoustic guitar build. And he says, I want you to meet my wife. I said, oh, hi, I'm Dad. She goes, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so weird. Cool, that's us. Thank you for being with us. This Friday will be Johnny Marr. Amazing. We're finally, yeah. finally getting to put that out. Um, beep, 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 everything, beep, beep, boop. Everything else is, is yeah. We've, those of you in the comments who spotted... Uh, Dan's Jag, I haven't seen it before, totally inspired by Johnny. We went out and managed to acquire one. Similarly, uh, a very kind TPS viewer has got in touch and is uh, lending us a Ricky 330 for a while as well. Can't wait. So we'll be doing that in the next couple of weeks um, and explore some of that. So awesome. happy days. Amazing. Thank you for being with us. Uh, there was going to be a video tomorrow, now there isn't, so we'll push that out a week. <laughs> We've got does mix, uh, does the J Rocket the Jeff sound like Mix Clon? 
because <laughs> the Noble Screamer video upset everyone, so let's do it all again. Did it? The yeah, funniest thing about that is that we really like the Noble Screamer. I know, and everyone's like, what do you hate this? Well, no, we it, really like it. It was Dan's favourite panel of the three, and everyone's like, what's your problem with the Noble Screamer? It's like, <laughs> it was Dan's favourite. Um, so we'll do that, and then uh, we've got one on the hearing protection and uh, protecting your hearing. Oh, that was, that was fascinating. An interesting discussion, I just yeah. need to get it uh, out. So good. Thank you, thank you, thank you to Jack. Well, thank you very much. Thank for you being for being here. And me. look out for Jack's pedal board build video coming up in two or three weeks, probably. Yes. Uh, pretenders? Yeah. He was just talking about Johnny, and it's like one of his favourite things is he said when he first said. Mm. Yeah. Players yeah. out there, boyos. <laughs>